His Excellency, Mr. Surya Chindawangse, Vice President of the United Nations Economic and Social Council, Ms. Amina Mohammed, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Ms. Armida Salsia Alice Jabana, Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Executive Secretary of SCAP, Mr. Kailash Satyarthi, 2014 Nobel Prize Laureate and SDG Advocate, who will be joining us online via Kudo, and Ms. Beverly Longit, Global Director, International Indigenous Peoples Movement for Self-Determination and Liberation. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, before we begin, I kindly ask for your attention for a few important announcements. We would like to share with you the COVID-19 related precautionary measures while attending meetings at the United Nations Conference Center in Bangkok. Kindly observe up to one meter physical distancing while sitting in the room. Please sit only on areas not marked with signages. We kindly ask you not to move signages, chairs, or other furniture in the room. Always wear your face mask except when taking the floor and having food in designated areas. Please put microphone covers on microphones before taking the floor. These measures are for your own safety and to safeguard the well-being of us all. I would now like to draw your kind attention to the following video on COVID-19 for meeting participants at the United Nations Conference Center. Welcome to the United Nations Conference Center, Bangkok. In light of Excellencies, distinguished delegates, this session is also being held via an e-conference platform called Kudo. You will be able to turn on your microphone and camera only when your request to speak has been submitted and accepted through the platform. We also welcome participants joining us via YouTube. I now turn over the proceedings to His Excellency, Ambassador Surya Chindawangse, Vice President of the United Nations Economic and Social Council, to chair the opening session. Excellency, the floor is yours. Well, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, um, welcome to the ninth Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development. I'm pleased to officially open the forum. As we start the ninth uh, APFSD, please allow me just to say a few words to kick off. Um, Ms. Amina Mohammed, uh, UN Deputy Secretary General, uh, Ms. Armida Salsia Alice Jabana, Under Secretary General and Executive Secretary of SCAP, Excellencies. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm honored to address you this morning in my capacity as the Vice President of the Economic and Social Council and to bring you warm greetings um, amidst cold weather in New York uh, from His Excellency Colin Vixen Kelapili, the permanent representative of Botswana 
and president of ICASOC. I would like to commend the SCAP Secretariat for the organization of the 9th APFSD, which contributes to the high-level political form of the ECOSOC. Now, when looking at the multitude of challenges that sustainable development seeks to address and overcome, I am reminded of a quote by John Donne, which is an English poet, uh, with a slight variation to reflect modern times. It goes something like this. No person is an island in and of itself. Every person is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Any person's suffering or death diminishes me because I'm involved in humankind and therefore never send to know for whom the to bell tolls. It tolls for you. The challenges of sustainable development and the consequences of not achieving it ultimately affects all of us because we are all connected and interdependent. In the long run, no island of prosperity, no atoll of affluence can long endure in a sea of poverty and an ocean of inequity. And as residents of the same planet, we all bear the consequences of the impacts of environmental degradation and climate change. And that is why the Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development is so important. Now, both the ICASOC and the Secretary General uh, of the United Nations see eye to eye on the urgent need to rescue the SDGs in view of the multidimensional challenges that humanity faces. Uh, the, they have already impeded the world's efforts and timelines to attain the SDGs. Indeed, the Asia-Pacific SDG Progress Report 2022 paints a gloomy picture. At the current pace, the Asia-Pacific will not achieve the goals until 2065. This is a lose-lose situation. So with this in mind, and with a win-win philosophy, the ECOSOC is working hand-in-hand -hand with the Secretary General as well as with the President of the United, General Assembly, United Nations General Assembly, to find effective and practical ways to reverse negative trends and accelerate progress through transformative actions, or to paraphrase the Secretary General, to turbocharge the SDGs. The ECOSOC is making intense preparations for the high-level political forum in July, with the theme Building Back Better from the COVID-19, while advancing the full implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. But this global process will not be complete without the active contribution of the various regions, including the regional commissions. Now, from my own direct experience chairing the coordination segment of the ECOSOC earlier this year in February, the inputs from an active engagement by regional commissions, including ESCAP, have been critical, from regional innovations regarding vaccine developments to regional approaches to closing gender gaps. Additionally, coordination and collaboration with sub-regional groupings is likewise important. And in this connection, as we are here in Southeast Asia, I'm pleased to have seen active partnerships between organizations such as ASEAN on the one hand and the United Nations and ESCAP on the other. So my message is simple. We hear you in New York and we look forward to your views. Let us make full use of this forum to contribute significantly to a robust global regional interface that would bring to the HLPF the Asia Pacific's voice from specific concerns to practical suggestions and the Asia Pacific's vision from long-term aspirations to forward-looking dreams. To achieve what? We all know, and that is to make sure that no one is left behind. I look forward to taking part in the deliberations of this forum this year and to receive its final report to ensure a timely consideration by the HLPF this July. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes my opening remarks, and I'd like to take this opportunity now to, there is a, a shadow play uh, uh, which we'll be watching. Uh, can I ask the secretary to play the video, please?
Well, thank you very much for that uh, presentation. It is now my pleasure to invite Ms. Armida Salcia Alisjabana, Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Executive Secretary of ESCAP, to deliver her welcome address, please. His Excellency, Ambassador uh, Surya Chindowangse, Vice President of ECOSOP, Ms. Amina Mohammed, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Excellencies, distinguished participants. Welcome to the ninth Asia Pacific Forum for Sustainable Development. Our forum theme is Building Back Better from COVID-19 while advancing the full implementation of the 2030 Agenda in Asia and Pacific. As governments scale up policies to reverse the socio-economic impacts of COVID-19 pandemic, the risk of climate emergencies remains a stark reality from the islands in the Pacific to the Aral Sea Basin in Central Asia. Adding to ever-changing landscape of disaster climate health risks, the ongoing geopolitical challenges are exacerbating sufferings of the common people. At the same time, these multiple crises offer an opportunity for us to regain our resolve in advancing the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Excellencies, our Asia and Pacific SDG Progress Report 2022 revealed some alarming trends. Achievement of all 70 goals is out of reach by 2030 in our region. Gaps are widening each year. At our current pace, our region will only reach the SDGs in 2065, or 35 years behind the target date. The region's progress on the goals that we will review during this year's forum, quality education, gender equality, life below water, life on land, and partnership for the goals has been limited or even stagnated in some cases. Regrettably, region has even regressed on others including those on sustainable consumption and production and climate action. Our estimates suggest that regional GDP growth to slow down and inflationary pressures to rise, which are primarily driven by soaring oil and commodity prices, supply chain disruptions, and fiscal constraints. Debt burden is poised to grow heavier for some emerging countries and countries in special situations, such as the LDCs, land landlocked developing countries and the cis or small island developing states. Excellencies, amidst these emerging uncertainties and polarization of trust, I'm encouraged to recognize a series of transformational policy measures by many of our member states and other stakeholders, from the private sectors to young entrepreneurs, from CSO to grassroots organization. During this crisis period, policy priorities of our member states have enabled to scale up e-learning opportunities and ensure gender equality and women's empowerment through digitalization of public services and local partnership. Decision makers have also been investing strategically to pursue socioeconomic policy reforms for building sustainable economy in line with a new normal situation. In another area of priority, we have seen a growing focus on climate smart trade, investment, and sustainable connectivity policies while mainstreaming digitalization. Furthermore, a more integrated approach to nature and human health have been rolled out as one of the policy measures to create pathways in bolstering biocircular green economy model and ensuring transition to green blue economies. Excellencies, as we launch later today, the Asia Pacific SDG Partnership Report 2022, prepared jointly with the Asian Development Bank and UNDP, there is a need to put policies into action by raising ambition in national recovery strategies to align with 2030 agenda, reinvigorating public and private finance for inclusive and sustainable development, and redefining regional cooperation with people and planet at the center. As in previous years, the forum's messages will be conveyed to the 2022 high-level political forum in July. Finally, today marks the 75th anniversary, exactly today, on the 28th of March, uh, which is uh, the establishment of ESCAP 75 years ago in Shanghai. For seven and a half decades, ESCAP has been the most inclusive platform to promote dialogue and foster joint regional cooperation in Asia and the Pacific. 
advocating complementarity of development approaches and frameworks remain, all, remain at the heart of the transformation and resurgence in the region. Let us recommit to this mission. I count on your continued support and leadership. I look forward to listening to your views on our future course of actions toward acceleration of SDGs while reinforcing our common agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, uh, Madam Secretary Secretary, for the warm and welcoming remarks. It is now my honor and pleasure to welcome uh, Ms. Amina Mohammed, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, to deliver her address, please. Thank you. Your Excellency, Mr. Don Armand Windai, the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs of Thailand, Your Excellency, Ambassador Surya Chindawongse, the Vice President of the Economic and Social Council, my two friends, Kailash Sarati and Beverly Longhead, my colleague, Ms. Amida Savisa Alisriyabana, Executive Secretary of ESCAP, colleagues from the UN uh, system, Excellencies that are here and those online. I really am thrilled to be here with you today for the opening of the Asia-Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development. We are meeting at a crucial time when our ability to achieve the goals that we set for ourselves in 2030 hang in the balance. COVID-19 has wrought havoc on our societies and our economies. And now the crisis in Ukraine is destabilizing a global economy still reeling from the pandemic. In the region, the combined risks of climate shocks, disasters, and COVID-19 have disrupted as many as 122 million lives and livelihoods and could cost over 1.3 billion USD annually. Achieving the sustainable development goals was never going to be easy, but it is still possible. Implementing the SDGs will require policy choices aligned with the 2030 agenda and a clear emphasis on leaving no one behind. It will require public action and investments rooted in strong institutions and governance models that are tailored to deliver inclusive, sustainable growth and development. The Secretary General's report on our common agenda provides focus and strengthens the case for urgent action. This ninth Asia-Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development is our opportunity to chart an ambitious path forward. I would like to highlight five priorities which I believe would help inform your discussions this week. First, we must build resilience against the pandemic. Rising cases and deaths in the region show that the pandemic is far from In 16 developing countries across Asia and the Pacific, less than half of the population has been vaccinated. Vaccine inequity is a moral outrage for us today and a danger for everyone. But even if the expected targets are met, vaccines alone are not enough. This is a watershed moment to build stronger health systems by investing in primary health care and health surveillance systems and in local production of vaccines, diagnostics and treatments. Second, we need investments in people. In the region, inequality is on the rise with close to 90 million people pushed back into extreme poverty and half of the population has no social protection system to fall back on. We need in, to invest in women, young people, people with disabilities, people working in the informal sector, as well as refugees and migrants. They have been hit the hardest by the pandemic and will continue to pay the highest price if we don't take urgent action. The recent endorsement of the action plan to strengthen regional cooperation on social protection demonstrates there is growing momentum in the region for comprehensive and inclusive social protection systems. Our global accelerator for jobs and social protection can provide critical support to these efforts and the leadership of ILO. It aims to create 400 million decent new jobs in the care, green and digital sectors and expand social protection to nearly 4 billion people half the global population by 2030. I call on member states in the region to join the High Ambition Coalition and support the work of the Accelerator. These actions need to go hand in hand with actions to achieve progress on the SDGs, especially on that of SDG 5, gender equality. We must tackle the dramatic increase in domestic violence since the start of the pandemic, strengthen policies to boost women's economic participation 
and reduce the burden of unpaid care work. The Secretary General has presented five transformative recommendations to achieve gender equality in this generation. Repealing all gender discriminatory laws, promoting gender parity in all spheres and at all levels of decision making, facilitating women's economic inclusion by providing access to jobs and to opportunities, ensuring a greater inclusion of younger women and implementing an emergency response plan to prevent and end gender-based violence. I would like to call on member states to implement these without delay. We cannot hope to build strong economies and societies without the full contributions of the other half of our population. Third, we must recover the huge learning losses of the pandemic and reinvent the future of education. Today, education systems across the world are being challenged. The Asia-Pacific region is not on track to achieve SDG 4 by 2030, and now pandemic-related school closures have created huge learning losses. In some countries, the pandemic is causing a generational catastrophe, and elsewhere, conventional education systems are struggling to prepare learners for our rapidly changing world. And that is why the Secretary General is convening a summit on transforming education this, summer, this September. The summit will help mobilize the action, ambition, solutions, and solidarity that are needed to transform education systems between now and 2030. We count on the active participation of governments and leaders in the Asia-Pacific region in the preparation of this summit. The pre-summit would be held in Paris at the end of June. Fourth, we must supercharge just green transitions. The latest IPCC report laid out an atlas of human suffering, particularly across the Asia-Pacific region, where the very existence of entire nations are threatened by rising sea levels and where we will see vulnerabilities grow with increased flooding, heat waves, drought, and extreme weather events. This report is a validation of why half of climate finance needs to be allocated to adaptation and why we need to act urgently to build capacity of developing countries to adapt and build resilience to the impacts of climate. This will require urgent reforms that are made to ensure that developing countries, particularly SIDS and LDCs, have access to climate finance. This will require all development banks must identify and design bankable ready-to-go projects that will protect people and vulnerable communities. At the same time, we must continue our efforts to keep global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Greenhouse gas emissions from the region are projected to increase by over 30% by 2030 compared to 2010 levels with catastrophic consequences. Building on the progress made in Glasgow, we need urgent efforts to reduce emissions and keep global warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. The next climate conference, COP27 in Egypt, the Africa COP, is a critical opportunity to generate more ambi ambitious emission reduction commitments from countries across Asia and the Pacific. We must accelerate the energy transition by investing in fossil fuel revenues in, low, in new low carbon development models in a just and an inclusive way. Moving away from coal and fossil fuels in a region that accounts for 75% of global coal-fired generation capacity will not be easy, but it is essential for our common future, and it is financially and technologically possible. This is why the Secretary General has been calling for the formation of climate coalitions to provide major emerging economies with resources and technology to accelerate the transition from coal. Developed countries, multilateral development banks, private financial institutions, and companies with the technical know-how need to join forces in these climate coalitions to deliver support to coal-intensive economies. In this region, Indonesia and Vietnam are leading the way, having announced their intention to get out of coal to transition to renewables, and India with their 500 gigawatts of renewable energy goal. Building a just transition includes more sustainable and resilient food systems. This is even more urgent in the light of the global compact, the global impact of the crisis in Ukraine on food security. Several Asian countries rely heavily on wheat imports from both Russia and Ukraine. We must also advance digital connectivity for a just transition. Half of the pe people in this region lack reliable, affordable access to the internet. 
the digital divide is a driver of inequality and exclusion. But with investments in affordable connectivity and digital skills, the shift to digital could become a driver of inclusion for the entire region, increasing the participation of women, of girls, young people, people with disabilities, and our marginalized groups. Fifth and finally, the Asia-Pacific region must continue to attract the required financial resources to invest in a better tomorrow. The Asia-Pacific region holds enormous potential with the value of thematic bonds growing from tenfold over the last five years. But rising debt and shrinking fiscal space across the region are reducing government's ability to make sustained investments in healthcare, education, social protection, and green and resilient infrastructure that are essential for the recovery and the attainment of the 2030 Agenda. Serious reforms to the international financial architecture and the global economic and tax governance are urgently needed to create the necessary fiscal space to build a strong recovery and invest in the SDGs, not only in this region, but around the world. And we welcome the work of ECOSOC in this aspect. Getting back on track to achieve the SDGs will require an overhaul of the international financial architecture and global economic governance if we are to achieve the SDGs and to achieve the Addis Ababa Agreement. We also need to improve global tax governance and effectively combat illicit financial flows. These are some of the key recommendations in the Secretary General's report on our common agenda, along with a call for a stronger voice for developing countries in all global decision making. We will continue to advocate for the rechanneling of special drawing rights from advanced economies to those in need and for the speedy operationalization of the International Monetary Fund's Resilience and Sustainability Trust. And we will continue to work with national governments to develop long-term financing strategies in support of the 2030 Agenda, including through the use of integrated national financing frameworks. Excellencies, tomorrow I will have the privilege of chairing the meeting of the Regional Collaborative Forum, our UN mechanism for bringing together all the UN regional directors in the Asia-Pacific region. With the UN reforms now well advanced, I hope we will be able to adopt an ambitious work plan to support countries across the region and agree on concrete deliverables that align with your vision. Through the regional collaborative platform, regional assets are providing much more agile and coordinated support to resident coordinators and UN country teams. From designing social protection and disaster risk reduction systems to raising the level of climate ambitions. And we are ready to do so much more. The issue-based coalitions stand ready to respond faster to emerging needs, and our collective work on SDG data and statistics supports countries to fill data gaps and to go beyond GDP as a way to measure progress and development. Excellencies, in closing, let me briefly return to the global ramifications of the crisis in Ukraine. Across the world, supply chains have been disrupted and the price of food, energy, transport, and other essential supplies have skyrocketed. We now face the real risk of growing hunger on an unprecedented scale. That is why earlier this month, the Secretary General set up the UN Global Crisis Response Group on Food, Energy, and Finance. Its primary role is to rally support and financing for countries, including in Asia Pacific, that are struggling to confront a cascade of crises. At this pivotal moment, we need your leadership, solidarity, and engagement in the support of the SDGs. We count on this forum to raise our ambition and to put us on track for meaningful progress between now and 2030. Together we can, and I believe we will, build a future of peace, of dignity, and of prosperity for all. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Madam, for the um, uh, Deputy Secretary General for the precious remarks and for the comprehensive message. I'd now like to introduce a video message um, from His Excellency Mr. Don Paramat Binai, the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs of uh, Thailand on behalf of the host government. Uh, can you please play the video message? Deputy Secretary General, Ms. Amina Mohammed, Under Secretary General and Executive Secretary of ASCAP, Ms. Amida Sasia Alistabana, Vice President of ECOSOC, Ambassador Surya Chinawong, Excellency 
distinguished delegates. We meet this year at a critical juncture in the pursuit of our mission to emerge stronger from the pandemic towards the full implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Against the backdrop of current global affairs of widespread conflicts and hardship, this forum is indeed timely to provide us with an opportunity for reflection. Here, please allow me to be direct. All our efforts to achieve sustainable development would be futile without peace and stability. They are the prerequisite, the necessary condition of sustainable development. Peace can be achieved not by parties to the conflict, mutually cancelling each other to the utmost. It can only be realized through engagement and dialogues. Peace and sustainable development are intertwined where one enables and reinforces the other and vice versa. Therefore, attaining peace by strengthening human security and people-centered development must be our priority in this decade of action. As we look forward to the building back better, let us not forget the continued urgency of COVID-19 response as threats of a new variants are still very imminent. Although we hope that the worst may have passed, it is too soon to lower our guard. We have to continue to mobilize resources and expertise so as to leave no one behind in this global health crisis. Thailand is determined to work closely with the international community to overcome this pandemic by addressing the inequitable access to vaccines and essential medical supplies. We will also continue to advocate for public health resilience as part of the global recovery effort and preparation for the future crisis. The foundation of sustainability is balance. To derive it balance, a new mindset is needed. We need to garner the awareness that maximization of profit and winner-take-all approach cannot be sustained. Humanity is facing unprecedented challenges on many fronts, be they health emergencies, climate changes, pollution, biodiversity loss, or the overconsumption of natural resources. Therefore, we must strike the right balance between environmental compensation and economic revitalization as we proceed with sustainable recovery. On Thailand's part, we have adopted the biocircular green economy model as an alternative strategy for sustainable and inclusive growth. Independently, biocircular and green economy is nothing new. But Thailand is proposing an integrated whole of BCG approach for the B, C, and G to work in tandem and optimize sustainable and balanced growth. Thailand, as the host of APEC 2022, is working with 20 economies of the Asia-Pacific region under the theme Open, Connect, Balance to promote a more resilient, inclusive, and green growth with the whole of BCG as our compass. We also need coordination to create synergy. Thailand commends ESCAP's effort to promote close consultations among UN countries and stakeholders to find converging paths for sustainable recovery that correspond with countries' development priorities and national context. As chair of the ECOSOX coordination segments, Thailand believes that the strengthened coordination between the ECOSOC and regional commissions and between the UN and regional and sub-regional organizations such as the ASCAP and ASEAN should be promoted and nurtured. Lastly, as the pandemic has highlighted the disparity within and among countries, South, South and multi-party cooperation remain indispensable to our global partnership. It's the crux of our efforts to move forward with the 2030 agenda in these difficult times. Thailand invites all partners to join us at the Global South South Development Expo 2022 in Bangkok this September. As we chart the way towards COVID-19 recovery, as well as balanced growth and sustainable development. With our steadfast determination and the international community working together on all fronts, I believe that the 2030 goal is within our reach. I uh, thank you and greetings to all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs for, for the remarks. 
Um, before I introduce the next speaker, let me just uh, a short program note. I think in the next few minutes, uh, the Deputy Secretary General, uh, the Executive Secretary of SCAP, myself, we will have to uh, depart from this room for an important engagement. So, um, and, and I'm very honored to, to, to have, uh, standing in my stead, the Deputy Secretary, Executive Secretary of SCAP, Mr. Kave, who will conduct the remainder of the opening session. So with that programmatic note in mind, may I uh, invite the next speaker, and I will leave uh, after the introduction. Uh, my apologies. Uh, I'm pleased to invite uh, Mr. Kailash Satyati, the 2014 Nobel Prize laureate and SDG advocate who is connected with us online from India to deliver his statement. So please, you have the screen and floor. My dear sister and your excellency, Deputy Secretary General Amina Muhammad, excellencies, dear sisters and brothers. We are sitting here, of course, in a very difficult situation. We are already facing pandemic and now this Ukraine situation, as some of you mentioned. We know that pandemic has exposed and exacerbated injustices, inequalities, and the problems which we have been facing in attaining sustainable development goals. But let me begin with the story of a 17-year-old girl, Kajal, whom we rescued from child labor, in fact, child bonded labor in a mica mining. She was having scars in her body while mining. She has never been to school. But after her rescue, she aspired to go to school as other children were going. She was very bright. And after a while, she has been elected as the head of her children's council, which we have created in the village. Kajal has one strong mission that no child is left out, no child is left behind in the village. She has been able to work with other agencies, teachers, village, parliament, and others, and ensure that 35 children, most of them were girls, were withdrawn from mica mining and enrolled in schools. It was not an easy task for a tribal indigenous girl and her colleagues. But she has to face other socio-cultural problems when she averted her and others' child marriages. Somehow she was convinced that without gender equality, without gender justice, the development of the village and education is not possible and would not be sustainable. She didn't use those jargons, but she was convinced that every child has to be in a school, particularly the girls. She was opposed by the rich people, influential people, the mica mining owners, contractors, village leaders, and so on for all this. But she did not stop. She told me once that what is needed is courage, courage to speak truth. What is needed is honesty. We have to be honest to ourselves, but we have to be equally honest to all those things we believe in. Dear friends, today we know the problems. We know that 260 million children have been out of school before pandemic. We also know that 152 million children were working as child laborers means that was the biggest obstacle 
to attend the school, going to school. But that number has increased between 2016 and 2020 to 160 million. There is no excuse for that. We cannot hide behind the excuse of pandemic now. We have to admit that we have not done enough for our children. We have not done enough to ensure that how these SDGs, SDG 4, SDG 5, and the SDGs would be accomplished. That required a bigger amount of political will, bigger amount of sense of urgency, and as uh, Amina has pointed out, a deeper sense of solidarity at all levels, which has been the key. We know that none of these SDGs could be achieved without, without considering that many of them are so interconnected. Education cannot be achieved in isolation, in vacuum, without linking it with, directly with uh, SDG 8.7. If so many children must be working and sold and bought like animals and in sometimes lesser price than the cattle, then we cannot think of inclusive quality, sustainable education. Secondly, hunger, poverty, gender discrimination, goal five, all these things are interconnected. And therefore, I have one or two uh, ideas. One is that at the United Nations level, but also at the national level, the governments and intergovernmental agencies dealing with different aspects of children, child labor, slavery, hunger, poverty, climate change, they have to come together. These ministries have to build stronger solidarity, stronger coordination and cooperation among themselves to achieve uh, goal four and other goals. Secondly, we have to make all the efforts to mobilize resources through conventional and non-conventional sources. As we know that in, uh, in Asia, uh, uh, there is a report of UNESCO and UNICEF, which has uh, uh, strongly uh, suggested that at least 10% increase in education budget is needed. And finally, I would strongly recommend that in this situation, particularly uh, in post-pandemic time, we need uh, a global fund or a global mechanism for uh, social protection. So a global social protection fund or so global social protection mechanism is needed because we have seen the good results in many parts of the world, where especially the girls and the children belonging to marginalized sections of society and their parents were provided with some social protection and we have seen the best result out of it. And finally, I would say, dear friends, we have enough knowledge about the problems. We have enough knowledge about the solutions. We have tools, what to work, which we have uh, got through the, our experience and knowledge. We have applied the best minds of the world to arrive at that situation. But this is the time to apply the best hearts. SDGs should be driven through the hearts, not just through the minds. We have to put our souls behind it. We have to put the utmost compassion and courage and conviction, and that is come out of our hearts. We have to use our hearts to achieve SDGs. We have enough knowledge. We have enough resources. We have all the tools. So I refuse to accept that we cannot achieve, we cannot attain all these SDGs in our time frame. What is required is the courage and compassion and conviction to do it with utmost solidarity. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Satyati, for your uh, heartfelt and, uh, and inspiring uh, intervention. Next, it's my absolute honor to uh, invite Ms. Beverly Longhead, the Global Director, International Indigenous Peoples Movement for Self-Determination and Liberation, to deliver her intervention. You had the floor. Um, thank you very much. Gawis ay agu, kanda kayo data ko amin. Warm solidarity greetings to all, especially to my colleagues uh, from the civil society who are joining us both offline and online. Yes, I am Beverly Longhead. I'm an Igorot, one of the Philippines' many indigenous peoples. University graduates Chad Boak and Jorain Ngujo became full-time volunteer teachers for the LUMAD, one of my country's most marginalized indigenous groups. They joined and supported the LUMAD people's struggle for ancestral land and self-determination. On February 24 this year, they were killed with three other volunteers claiming they were members of an armed group. Their deaths presents a grim picture of human rights and development in our region. Human rights monitors indicate that Asia and the Pacific, human rights, land, and environmental defenders face increasing violence. As we open the ninth Asia Pacific Forum on sustainable development, we remember, we honor Chad, Drain, and other defenders in the region who sacrificed their lives for people's rights, climate, and development. If we want to build back better, listen, listen to the voices of indigenous peoples and the people's movement. Indigenous peoples and grassroots communities play a vital role in developing alternative approaches and sustainably managing resources and biodiversity, a truth that has not reached adequate public recognition and attention despite the agency that could benefit everyone in caring for the environment and seeking sustainable development. If we want to build back better, we need to look back and acknowledge the root structural causes of inequalities. Two years into the COVID pandemic, we are light years away from achieving the SDGs, especially on education, gender equality, life below water, life on land, and means of implementation. The pandemic disrupted the process of attaining these goals and exposed the growing inequality and inequity between the wealthy and the poor. We must recognize structural barriers that perpetuate inequalities and act on them using systemic approaches. We pursue people-centered development by addressing humanitarian relief alongside long-term goals. We build peace by addressing neoliberal paradigms that cause and aggravate social unrest. Indeed, parties to the conflict should engage in sincere and meaningful negotiations and dialogues. If we want to build back better, ensure people's meaningful participation and effective engagement that leave no one behind. Civil society is in the best position to speak on the realities on the ground and forward solutions that are suited to our context. Unfortunately, we are under attack as decent and activism are criminalized and tagged as abating acts of terror. We must stop this and we assert, as we assert our inclusion and expand civic space now and beyond the pandemic. Development actors, specifically donors and governments, should protect civil space and uphold the integrity of inclusive multilateralism to achieve our shared goals. Let us ensure the full, effective, and meaningful participation of the marginalized and vulnerable, indigenous peoples, peasants, workers, migrants, the Dalits, women, youth, and children, 
LGBTQI, and persons with disabilities. Development justice embodies looking back and learning, recognizing and solving structural barriers, becoming accountable, upholding human rights, and bringing in people's participation. Let us build back better by collectively working for system change. Kasin, gawis ay ago kanda kayo amin, iyaman. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Madam, for your statement, the sobering reality that you bring, and for your participation. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, uh, we would now like to move to agenda item 1B, the election of officers to the Bureau. The Bureau will comprise a chair and vice chairs. May I now open the floor for any nominations for the positions of the chair and vice chairs. I recognize the distinguished delegate of India. Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning to everyone present here. Uh, my delegation has the honor in proposing the following delegates to serve on the Bureau of the Ninth Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development. As Chair, His Excellency, Mr. Carl Kendrick Tiuchua, Secretary of the National Economic and Development Authority of the Philippines. Following the tradition of the Asia Pacific Forum for Sustainable Development, all ministerial level participants in attendance are proposed to be elected as vice chairs. My delegation is confident that the distinguished delegates who have been nominated would discharge their duties efficiently and effectively for the successful deliberations of the forum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Excellency. The distinguished delegate uh, of India has nominated His Excellency Carl Kendrick Chiu Chua, Secretary of the National Economic and Development Authority in the Philippines as Chair of the Ninth Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development. And all the ministerial level delegates as vice chairs to the ninth APFSD. Would any delegation wish to second the nomination? I recognize the distinguished delegate from Thailand. Madam, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My delegation has the honor to sec in seconding the nomination proposed by the distinguished delegates of India for the Bureau position in the Ninth Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development. My delegation has full confidence in the proposed Bureau in discharging their duty for a successful deliberation. Thank you. Thank you so much. A distinguished delegate of Thailand. Are there any other nominations for the Bureau of the Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development at its ninth session? I see none. Just to confirm, nothing online. I see none. I therefore have the pleasure to formally announce the Bureau of the Ninth Session of the Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development is composed, is composed of the following. As Chair, His Excellency Carl Kendrick Tiu Chua, Secretary of the National Economic and Development Authority in the Philippines. As Vice Chairs, all the ministerial level delegates. Please join me in congratulating the officers of the Bureau for their election. Uh, distinguished delegates, uh, excellencies, it is now my honor to invite His Excellency Carl Kendrick Tiu Chua, Secretary of the National Economic and Development Authority in the Philippines to conduct this meeting from this point forward. As we allow for the changes of chairs, 
I understand that, that we might be a short break. We're just changing and going straight into it. So, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, with, with, within one moment, we will, we will be inviting uh, His Excellency Carl Kendrick Tiu Chua to take on his role. One moment. Okay, over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Deputy Executive Secretary. Economic and Social Council Vice President Surya Chindawong, United Nations Under Secretary General Armida Salcia Alishabana, His Excellency Deputy Prime Minister Don Pramwa Twinay, United Nations Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, good morning. It is my pleasure to join you today in the ninth Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development. This forum serves not only as a platform to learn from each other's experiences in overcoming and building back better from the debilitating effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, but more importantly, it is an avenue to take stock of how far we have gone and how far we still need to go in achieving the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. Like the rest of the world, the Asia-Pacific region is still reeling from the aftershocks of a pandemic that has plagued us for the past two years. The pandemic was a litmus test on the resilience and adaptability of our systems and institutions. At its worst, it magnified the vulnerabilities in established systems, highlighted the frailties in existing policies, and threatened to reverse our hard-earned gains in achieving the SDGs. It left a trail of destruction in its wake as it increased unemployment, reduced millions to poverty, and exacerbated inequalities. The unique experiences of countries in Asia Pacific, such as the Philippines, as well as our shared struggles to rise above the challenges posed by the pandemic are replete with lessons and best practices we can all draw from as we strive to shape a better Asia Pacific region in the face of a new reality. Taking stock of our varied experiences in developing innovative solutions aimed at keeping society and the economy afloat will enable us to prepare for the greater challenges that lie ahead. Despite the pandemic, Asia Pacific has made steady progress in reaching the SDGs. While this is laudable, so much more needs to be done in realizing our vision of creating a change that is truly transformative in the lives of all. For the impact of economic growth to be lasting and profound, it must be built on the bedrock of sustainable development with the people, planet, and peace as its core. Critical to this will be our capacity to work together in partnership for the goals. With this in mind, I invite all of you to contribute actively to the discussions in the coming days as we work together towards advancing the cause of sustainable development. Thank you very much. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, let us now take up the agenda in item 1C, adoption of the agenda as presented to you in the document SCAP slash RFSD slash 2022 slash L.1. Are there any comments on this document? If there are no comments, the agenda as contained in the document SCAP slash RFSD slash 2022 slash L.1 is hereby adopted. Distinguished delegates, I thank you for your cooperation in adopting the agenda of the ninth APFSD. Before we continue with agenda item two, I understand the secretary of the forum has some announcements to make. I now invite the secretary to take the floor. Thank you, Chair, for giving me the floor. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, Kindly note that remote simultaneous interpretation of the proceedings is provided by the United Nations for the purpose of facilitating communication 
in light of the fact that there are six official languages of the United Nations, four of which are used at SCAP. Participants are requested to be mindful of the additional difficulties experienced by interpreters when working in remote mode and of the increased likelihood of disruptions to the audio feed to the interpreters. Only the speech or intervention in the original language is authentic and constitutes an authentic record of the proceedings. In case of any inconsistency between the interpretation and the speech or intervention in the original language, the latter shall prevail. In addition, interpreters servicing remote meetings cannot be held liable for interruption of service, pixelation, freezing or loss of visual input, partial or complete loss of audio, audible artifacts, unauthorized access to personal or confidential data, leaking of information due to inadequate soundproofing and or data loss. Thank you for attention on these matters. I now turn the proceedings back over to the chair. Thank you very much. I hereby declare the opening session concluded and we shall now proceed with the agenda, next agenda item. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, this meeting is called to order. We shall now continue agenda item two, building back better from COVID-19 while advancing the full implementation of the 2030 agenda in Asia and the Pacific. Specifically, this session will discuss the theme of building back better from COVID-19 while advancing the full implementation of the 2030 agenda in Asia and the Pacific. The document pertinent to this session are building back better from the coronavirus disease or COVID-19 while advancing the full implementation of the 2030 agenda for sustainable development in Asia and the Pacific. This is the document SCAP slash RFSD slash 2022 slash one and the implementation of the 2030 agenda for sustainable development at the sub-regional level or the document SCAP slash RFSD slash 2022 slash two. For this session, we are very honored to get the support of Ms. Valerie Julian, United Nations Resident Coordinator in Indonesia, who will be moderating the ministerial panel discussion. May I thus invite Ms. Julian and the distinguished speakers to come to the rostrum and Ms. Julian to moderate the discussion. Over to you, ma'am. I hope you can hear me now. <laughs> good. So thank you very much, Your Excellency, and, and uh, good morning, very good morning to uh, all of you, Excellencies and distinguished delegates, and all of you present with me today. A pleasure uh, to, uh, to, to moderate this session. And um, let me start first by wishing a happy anniversary to ESCAP, since it is the day. So let us hope that there will be many more years of success. So as it has been very clearly uh, explained and highlighted by the previous uh, speakers during the opening of this forum, the magnitude of the challenge that is ahead of us to achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals by 2030 in the Asia-Pacific region is now even greater than it was two years ago. And indeed, the pandemic has slowed down or in some cases reversed many of the region's development gains. So faced with such a challenge, we cannot but redouble our efforts, innovate wherever it's possible, but above all, learn the lessons that the pre-pandemic situation has taught us. Indeed, we cannot blame the pandemic for everything because already before the pandemic, the achievement of the sustainable development goals in our region was not on track. But the pandemic has, of course, accelerated some trends. It has exacerbated some inequalities and vulnerabilities. And it has, as well, shed a very crude light on some realities we had ignored, despite many warnings and a lot of calls to action. The previous speakers actually have highlighted the inequalities that continue to exist in the world and in our region social and economic inequalities, gender and ethnic inequalities, attack against human rights, and the war now unfolding in Ukraine and the lines that peace and stability 
are at risk as well. This is why the following sustainable development goals will be reviewed at this forum and will be the focus of our discussion. We will look more particularly at goal four on quality education, at goal five on gender equality, at goal 14 on life below water, at goal 15 on life on land, and of course goal 17 on partnership for the goals. So to this end, the distinguished panelists of this ministerial session will discuss the challenges and integrated approaches to reshape the dynamics of recovery with a focus on inclusion, empowerment, and longer-term sustainability and resilience. So drawing from the highlight of the document that ESCAP uh, released before this forum, the discussion will revolve around national recovery strategies to reignite and accelerate the implementation of the 2030 uh, agenda, but also, and above all, to address the vulnerabilities within countries through policy action in the following areas. First, aligning and raising the ambition of national recovery strategies with the 2030 agenda and leaving no one behind. Second, protecting and investing in people, ensuring social protection and quality education for all and advancing gender equality. Third, accelerating the transition to green economies. And fourth, strengthening regional cooperation and partnership. And for this, I am very honored to welcome to this panel Her Excellency Ayush Aryunzaya, Minister of Labor and Social Protection uh, of Mongolia, His Excellency Johnny Usamate, Minister of Infrastructure and Meteorological Services, Land and Mineral Resources of Fiji, His Excellency Ali Sabri, Minister of Justice of Sri Lanka, and His Excellency Mohamed Deldi Serdarov, Acting Minister of Finance and Economy of Turkmenistan. So to initiate this discussion, I would like to call on Her Excellency Ayush Aryunzaya to take the floor. Thank you very much, Her Excellency. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I would like to join you in uh, congratulating everyone on the 75th anniversary of uh, UNS Cup. Um, it is my distinct honor to address the 9th as, um, Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development on behalf of the uh, Mongolian government. Uh, I would like to commend the importance of uh, this event um, it, at this crucial time where the whole world has been um, encountering the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which has uh, really slowed down the uh, progress on SDGs. The COVID-19 pandemic has, of course, very negative consequences, but also some positive con consequences where we have had transited um, tra um, the transmission to the digital uh, world. All the conferences, all the meetings, all the work has been digitalized. And it is actually my first meeting in person uh, um, since... Um, 2020, and uh, I am very happy that you all have uh, made it uh, to come to Bangkok, and um, we are having this first meeting in, in person. Together we are going through the time when the economy, education, medical science, manufacturing services are challenging in all areas, as well um, as understanding the importance of um, being a uh, human. Um, social relations, people's lifestyles, attitudes, beliefs, convictions. Well, uh, coming to Mongolia, Mongolia's economy has been growing steadily since 2017, uh, but fell to minus 5.3% uh, in 2020. Um, it is the lowest since 1992. The government of Mongolia has taken uh, following measures to support uh, vulnerable target households and individuals during the pandemic. We have taken measures since early 2020. Uh, we have uh, spent um, in 2019 to social protection, we have spent 2% of the budget of uh, GDP. Uh, then in 2020, uh, we have doubled, uh, we've spent 4% on GDP uh, for social protection. 
In 2021, we have spent 30% of whole state budget only to social protection in measures of protecting um, households as also enterprises during con uh, pandemic. The monthly child support allowance, uh, which was previously targeted, uh, has been uh, transferred um, to child support, universal support. So every child in Mongolia has, um, um, has received the child support money, which was actually also increased fivefold times. Every household has received also free energy, heating, water and water supplies. Business entities exempted social insurance premiums, taxes from the insured and employers. According to the statistics of 2021, poverty rate has decreased from 2018 to 2020, um, has decreased by 0.6%. Previously, in 2018, the poverty rate in Mongolia was 28.4%. And now in 2020, we have numbers of 27.8%, and this during the pandemic. So we see that the government of Mongolia has taken good measures in protecting the households and entities. Of course, it is a small, significant process, but the um, government of Mongolia has paid really uh, strong attention to the health of citizens. Each and every uh, citizen um, has received free vaccination. By now, 90%, 96% of the um, targeted population has already the second dose of the vaccine. Around 70% of the targeted population has the third dose of the vaccination. When everyone had to stay at home during the strong, uh, strong quarantine measures, every citizen has also received premium from the government. So Mongolia has uh, spent real, uh, very good during the um, COVID time. Now we are, having, we are transiting to the new revival policy after post-COVID. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, uh, Your Excellency. Actually, you have very well um, indicated how your government actually has, uh, has responded to the social impact of the COVID crisis, how you increase, for instance, the payment of cash transfer for families with children. But we know that the, the, the crisis has also uh, set back a number of progress on gender, uh, in, in gender equality, and it has aggravated many of the social and economic inequality women and girls have faced and still face, including a high vulnerability to employment and income loss and a, and, and a disproportionate burden of unpaid care. So would you please highlight what measures the government of Mongolia has taken to address these intensified inequalities and uh, vulnerabilities? The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, yes, indeed, um, during the quarantine time when the schools uh, and kindergartens were uh, stayed closed, the labor force participation of women lowered, went back. So now um, the difference between uh, labor force participation between men and women is 25% of difference. So um, even with the education, it is not only that the education part of the children went back, it is also uh, influencing women who are staying at home and care um, of their children. So now we have uh, the new labor law is now in act uh, since uh, January 1st of this year, which allows women staying at home, work from distance, work in uh, hour, hourly, as also uh, work from home. There are new ways of labor um, in the market now. As also uh, men, men are now more promoted to have uh, um, to care for their children. The newborn uh, fathers with the newborn, they can have uh, paid uh, leave also now. That, um, so by the law, um, now the care of the children is not the only responsibility of women. So the husbands can also care for their children. We have increased the paid uh, leave uh, for the, um, if the children are at home or sick, so the parents can have also paid leave uh, at least a week or two weeks. Um, the government has also now programs on um, promotion of uh, women labor. 
So with that, we try to increase uh, the gender participation of um, women in the labor force as also at the decision lab uh, making level. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was, this was very enlightening and uh, definitely a lot of good measures here and a good lessons to learn. Let us now move to our next uh, speakers and our next speaker is actually online. It is His Excellency uh, Johnny Usamate, the Minister of Infrastructure and Meteorological Services, Lands and Mineral Resources of Fiji. So Excellency, a wealth of good practices to promote inclusive and environmentally sustainable recovery have already emerged from the region, we know that. So could you please tell us how the government of Fiji is actually building back better through investing in climate resilience and sustainable infrastructure and disaster readiness? The floor is yours. I hope you can hear us well. Do we have our speakers or is there any issue of connection? If not, maybe should I move on to the next speaker? Meanwhile, we sort out the, the technical issue. Yeah, let, let us do that. So let us use the opportunity that we have a second in-person speaker today, who is uh, His Excellency uh, Sabri, Minister of Justice of Sri Lanka. So, Excellency, the need to shift to a more sustainable, inclusive and resilient uh, development pathway is clearer than ever. And the government of Sri Lanka is focusing on investment in low carbon and resource efficient economy. Could you please tell us more about how the government of Sri Lanka is actually accelerating the transition to an inclusive green economy for an environmentally sustainable recovery? The floor is yours, sir. Oh, Madam Chair. Yeah, Your Excellencies, distinguished panelists and delegates, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of the government of Sri Lanka, I would like to thank the UN Enscape for the convening the Ninth Asia Pacific Forum. Sri Lanka's commitment towards 2030 agenda is explicit. In the steady progress we are making on the SDG and recent initiative taken to further strengthen the integrated planning, monitoring and review process, and sustainable financing to attain SDGs. Social economic impacts of COVID-19 remains the greatest challenge we face threatening our progress on SDGs. Strategic interventions have been made to address our post-COVID revival and sustainable development challenges. This include, among other matters, for example, economic transformation underpin on green growth. Our foremost priority is to revitalize our economy, capitalizing on an export-oriented growth and increase investment toward a low carbon and resource efficient economy supported by healthy ecosystem and well protected managed oceans and marine coastal ecosystem that support inclusive and sustainable livelihoods of our people. The expectation is to enable our country's transition towards a manufacturing economy based on the above and leveraging on Sri Lanka's strategic location in the Indian Ocean being the crossroads of major sea and air routes. As approximately 70% of the workforce in Sri Lanka is informally employed, being vulnerable to be pushed into abject poverty, particularly during the crisis situation, the pressing need for formalization of the labor market can also be addressed in the process of our economic transition towards the manufacturing hub. Alongside this, the important steps are taken to drive industrialized and businesses towards greener and more sustainable pathways. For example, as communicated in our updated national determined contribution submitted by UNFCC, our resolve is to increase the forest cover to 32% and attain carbon neutrality in electricity generation by 2050 and full carbon neutrality by 2060. As a medium term target, we hope to enhance the share of renewable energy in a country to total energy mix to reach a target fulfilling of 70% of the Sri Lanka's energy demands from renewable sources by 2030. Important initi initiatives are taken um, to facilitate this transition, including increased investment in renewable energy generation through both public and private sectors. It is, ex it is our expectation to add 2,000 megawatts to the national grid from renewable sources in the next three years. In addition, with the adoption of the Colombo Declaration on Sustainable Nitrogen Management, 
we have set ourselves an ambitious target to have nitrogen waste by 2030. Business models that can apply and promote circular economy approaches are being incentivized and policy and administrative action is taken banning single-use plastic, banning agrochemicals and chemical fertilizer and promoting organic fertilizer farming as well as promoting e-mobility. Complementing the above effort, Sri Lanka is exploring the financial potential available in the areas of sustainable finance of, or green financing in support of the industrial and business that are greener, climate friendly and socially inclusive. Sri Lanka is also in the process of developing Sri Lanka's SDG investor map with the support of UNDP Sri Lanka in order to unlock new levels of private capital flows towards the SDG. So apart from that, we are also looking at uh, introducing and, and offering green and blue bonds to sustain and finance our projects in the country. That is how we are trying to reset our targets in this very challenging uh, circumstances amidst uh, the world and also particularly in Sri Lanka. Thank you very much. And actually, um, uh, when we were discussing the issue of vulnerability for the, the people and the region, we know that we need this whole of government uh, solution to address the, the problem. So can you tell us, and using the opportunity that we have the Minister of Justice with us, uh, how the government of Sri Lanka has leveraged a broader legal and judicial, judicial reform to work across actually ministries and sectors to build back better? Yeah, we have put a lot of effort towards the <coughs> um, increasing the justi access to justice to the people of Sri Lanka. We have adopted five strong strategies towards that, in <coughs> increasing the number of judges, increasing the infrastructure. Digitalization is in the pipeline. We are rolling out a digitalization map so that we use technology to enhance. Uh, act actually, we use the COVID-19 pandemic as an opportunity to digitalize it. Otherwise, we did not have access to that. There was a slow progress towards it. We made use it as an opportunity to open it up so that we connected the people with the digital uh, courts and also the prisons with the digital courts and hearings were done uh, through digitalization. And we are also looking at uh, overall enhancement of the legal reform process in the country. Legal reforms have been uh, uh, expedited. We have uh, looked at targeted areas and we have established subcommittees to reform civil law, criminal law, and commercial law. For example, uh, we are introducing innovative courthouses such as small claim courts in order to reduce pressure on day-to-day -day, uh, more important court cases, as well as introducing uh, investor sentiment, investor court uh, all over, uh, uh, in Sri Lanka so that investors will resolve their issues sooner and faster in order to um, uh, um, attract more investors to come to the country. So apart from that, uh, we are also looking at uh, reforming old age um, prejudices against women. For example, some of our Sri Lankan um, land development ordinance was discriminated toward women, whereas uh, in the, um, when, when, when it comes to uh, getting succeeded to somebody's property, you couldn't get it for a woman. So we have removed that uh, barriers. Now women and men are equally entitled uh, in terms of getting um, their share from the parents. And apart from that, we are looking at an ambitious reforms to the Muslim marriages and divorce activities where uh, we want to bring the women also as equally important to the other areas of it. So we have a focused um, strategy towards reform in the Sri Lankan legal sector on that uh, five areas of importance, uh, namely law reforms, more courthouses, more judges, digitalization, and improving the capacity of those institutions, including the judges. Thank you very much. And uh, it's, it's really great to, to learn about all those measures that the Sri Lankan government has put in place. Thank you very much. I think now we uh, can connect with our uh, distinguished speaker from uh, Fiji, His Excellency uh, Johnny Usamate. Minister of Infrastructure and Meteorological Services, Lands and Mineral Resources of Fiji. So just for, I hope we, are, we have the connection. So just to initiate again the discussion with uh, His Excellency uh, Usamate, let me uh, reformulate the question again. I was referring to the, the wealth of good practices to promote inclusive and environmentally sustainable recovery that we know exists in this region. 
And my question was uh, to Mr. to His Excellency uh, Osamate was how the government of Fiji is actually building back better through this uh, investing in climate resilience and sustainable infrastructure and disaster readiness. The floor is yours, sir. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity for Fiji to participate in this uh, ministerial panel and the question in relation to resilient uh, infrastructure. As you know, in all of our small island nations, anything to do with uh, development is related to climate. Uh, for Fiji, in terms of, we have about around six measures that I'd like to highlight that Fiji is looking at in order to respond to the resilience of our infrastructure. Number one is the government has undertaken its climate vulnerability assessment, where we have uh, done this benchmarking exercise to see the kind of losses that we get as a result of climate change. And the estimate says it that around five, Fiji $500 million, or around US dollars of $200 million. This climate vulnerability assessment has highlighted five priorities for us over the next 10 year period. And we also have an indication of the amount of money that is needed to address these issues. And it amounts to around Fiji 9.3 billion. And it covers around five different areas. First of all, the design and construction of more resilient towns and cities with a focus on developing safe greenfield sites, improving our infrastructure ser services. Third, to support climate uh, smart agriculture and fisheries. Fourth, the um, conversion conversation of ecosystems and the natural environment to protect our development assets, and fifth, to build up our overall socio-economic resilience by caring for the vulnerable and promoting uh, inclusive economic growth. The second one is making sure that we have access to risk information and incorporating this into our plans. And this is something that is also required by Fiji's Climate Change Act, which looks at all of the impacts that we have in terms of uh, climate change. That's the second one. And the third that we have is looking at uh, resilient infrastructure, the things that are required for Fiji's National Building Code. Fiji's National Building Code is required to be uh, reviewed every five years for the purpose of strengthening our climate resilience of our infrastructure. And this, there are about uh, four different areas that we're focusing on in terms of our National Building Code. One, to raise the standards and changing the uh, designs for projects underground, taking into account the kind of uh, conditions that we face now. Very intense rainfall, very intense rainfall in short periods of time. The most damage that we're getting is coming out of floods rather than cyclones. Secondly, redesigning schools and hospitals so that they can withstand, withstand category five cyclones and then become act as a shelter for our population. Third, to build back better, to ensure that communities in prime cyclone paths have the resources to make small upgrades to their own homes so that they can minimize future damage. And also to make sure that um, our infrastructure for electricity, for instance, is put underground so that it can withstand damages in the future. The fourth strategy is planned community relocation. Fiji has actually entrenched into law the crucial causation linkages between climate change and natural disasters and recognizing the long-term impact of this. Uh, as such, the Fijian government has relocated, already re relocated six communities to date, from where they have always lived to somewhere where they need to move because the sea level has, uh, has, uh, has risen or there has been landslides. So relocation, of course, is our last option, last resort, with uh, all other adaptation measures need to take precedence. Uh, but additionally, we are also working on fine-tuning our standard operation procedure and guidelines for planned relocations. We have in total more than 40 communities that need to be relocated. So the government of Fiji has a planned approach to this. The fifth thing is that we're working on at the moment is our early warning systems. Our early warning systems also play a huge role in shepherding Fijians to safety and avoiding catastrophic loss of life. We have had due to the more rapid and intense cyclones and the intensity of the floods that we have had over the past two years. We owe that success to the whole of government approach Warning systems need to transcend different government agencies, making sure that they're all working together. Uh, with their collective efforts and with Marshall to build that resilience, we have mainstreamed, uh, mainstreamed adaptation into our national planning, embedding climate-centric principles and values across all aspects of government decision-making policies. And the last, the sixth one that I was talking about, 
now for government is looking at nature-based solutions. Uh, most of our villages in Fiji are uh, beside the sea, on the rivers. Everybody wants seawalls in Fiji just to protect their current location. But conventional seawalls are very expensive. So what government has done is to look at, as we build seawalls, integrate nature-based solutions, bringing in mangroves, boulders, and vetiva grass that has long roots that can uh, preserve the soil. So we have built these eco seawalls. They've already built two already, one on the island of Wawalau, one in Madhuwata. There are three more of these uh, eco seawalls being built, and we have 16 planned into the future. So these are just some of the six examples of six of the measures that have been implemented by the government of Fiji so far to make sure that we have more resilient infrastructure to look after the lives of our people. Thank you very much for this uh, example. And definitely, uh, Fiji is one of these countries that uh, has to face enormous challenges. And, uh, and the, the, the whole of government approach that you have uh, indicated uh, to build resilience and adaptation into national planning, ingraining the climate-centric thinking is very important. But now, could you tell us more about how the government of Fiji has worked across ministries and sectors to raise ambition and set clear, medium and long-term targets to achieve the SDGs as part of the Building Back Better. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, in Fiji, uh, everything that is in the SDGs is actually embedded in our national development plans. National development plans that we have set uh, for us over the next five years and the next 20 years. And all government ministries, all government agencies, they need to develop their own organizational strategic plans and business plans on the basis of those NDPs. So that then it uh, permeates all of the different plans of all the agencies. So there are 17 SDG goals and the 169 indicators. They have been put into all of our national plans and organizational plans across the various ministries in Fiji. So some of the areas that we're looking at, for instance, in SDG 1 on social protection, Fiji has introduced a number of unemployment assistance schemes that became very important during COVID-19 where about 100,000 people lost their jobs. Fiji had to look for funding. We had to use more than $500 million that was paid out as unemployment assistance since the start of COVID-19 pandemic. And this helped around 400,000 Fijians, almost half of our population. The payments were facilitated through digital platforms, which made it much easier for people to access that assistance. For SDG 4, for access to quality education, as you know, COVID-19 disrupted the whole education space. A major challenge, however, the Fijian government continued its commitment to ensuring that access to quality education is maintained um, using digital platforms. And we swiftly, the government responded swiftly, used digital platforms to provide learning resources and also provide targeted to support to those that did not have access to learning materials. Uh, for SDG 7, in terms of energy, Fiji has just re recently launched the SDG 7 roadmap which outlines the energy transition plans in order to remain on track for the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It has, uh, talks about things about unclean uh, cooking fuel and the things that government needs to do in order to address these issues. And uh, the responses cut across different ministries, different government agencies. For SDG 13 and for climate action, we have put our National Fiji's Climate Change Act so this act is at the heart of all our national policies and priorities. We also now have a climate change division in the Ministry of Economy. So anything that takes place in the different ministries ties up to what we do at the Ministry of Economy. The act integrates our risk-informed decision-making, established of a robust government architecture for climate change response and legal structure for assisting and financing economic-wide resilience and decarbonization. And in relation to that, Fiji's NDC investment plan provides our mitigation priorities and opportunities in the transport and energy sector. And you have just established Fiji's climate finance strategy, which identifies across all the different sectors in government, this strategy identifies what are the key ones, and it transcends all the different ministries, the different um, entities that we have in government. For SDG 14 on oceans, we have a Fiji national ocean policy that provides a specific on the healthy ocean that will sustain livelihood and aspirations of our current and our future generation. And all the indicators under this SDG, uh, SDG are being implemented by different agencies across government through the support of our development partners. For SDG 17, for partnerships, Fiji's COVID-19 vaccination campaign was made possible through the support of our development partners through the COVAX 
facility. And our partnership with the development partners has enabled us to now open our international borders and revive the Fijian economy through the tourism sector, which has been the mainstay of our economy for the past few years. And one of the things that we've seen that has really grown in the aftermath of all this is digital innovation. Digital innovation has become a really powerful driver of sustainable development. And Fiji's experience has shown that the digital revolution can have an outsized, a very large benefit for small island developing states. Fiji recorded a 300% surge in data usage during COVID-19. And subsequently, as a result of that, Fiji is planning to have major investments in the ICT infrastructure. We are accelerating the online registrations of birth, death, marriage, and business registrations for convenience and building back better. A key challenge we'll continue to face is the availability of timely and accurate data on all of our 17 SDGs in order to better reflect on our progress in the areas of essential improvement. While our Thank voluntary national review is guiding us, working with ESCAP and all our development partners to address this data and information gap to gauge our progress. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for all these uh, very interesting uh, measures that were taken in Fiji, indeed a very challenged uh, country uh, geographically. Um, I would like now to call on our fourth speaker, who is uh, His Excellency Mohamed Jeldi Serdarov, who is the Acting Minister of Finance and Economy of Turkmenistan. I hope uh, he is online. And uh, with His Excellency, we are going to discuss actually the issue of uh, fiscal capacity and fiscal space that were mentioned this morning by the Deputy Secretary General and how this has played um, a central role in uh, determining the country's capacity to actually cope with the economic and the social impact that the COVID pandemic has, uh, has, uh, has put on the countries. So we have seen all across the region how government have actually provided uh, fiscal packages to stimulate the demand, uh, the finance emergency health measures and that have been put in place, and also the expansion of social uh, protection programs. So it would be really great to hear from, um, uh, in more detail from the government of Turkmenistan, how did, did the government responded, respond to the economic impact of COVID-19? Are we connected? We've lo yeah, there you are. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, allow me to express my gratitude for the opportunity to participate in this forum. One of the key areas of the socio-economic development of Turkmenistan is the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. 85% of the SDG goals and targets are included in our national programs. At the beginning of this year, our country has adopted a new long-term national program of social and economic development of Turkmenistan for 2022-2052. It's called Revival of a New Era of Sovereign State, which provides four strategic approaches to achieving the SDGs taking into account the geopolitical and economic situation in the world. The economic consequences of the COVID-19 coronavirus have also affected our country. Since the emergence of the global pandemic, the government of Turkmenistan has taken active measures to stimulate demand and finance energy, medical integration, including including preventive measures. We have also revised health and social protection programs and significantly increased expenditures on the purchase of medical equipment, vaccines and drugs. At the government level, we have set up an emergency anti-epidemic commission to regulate measures to protect citizens and the economy of the country from the pandemic. Since the beginning of last year, in order to protect the population against the coronavirus infection, uh, vaccination of persons over 18 years old of age has been carried out actively. Turkmenistan 
also cooperates with the World Health Organization, the United Nations and other international financial organizations. Thus, in 2020 and 2021, our country received technical assistance from the Asian Development Bank for the total amount of 408,000 US dollars for the purchase of equipment and medical products. The World Bank has provided a concessional loan of 20 million US dollars as part of the Countering COVID-19 project. In conjunction with the United Nations, several programs have been drawn up and are being implemented. And uh, to in as well, we are taking re rapid response measures. At the end of December 2021, we adopted a program to mitigate the impact of the economy of complications arising in the global economy and stable development of the national economy for 2022, which defines special tasks for maintaining multilateral and sustainable growth of the national economy, introduction of digital technologies, providing government support to uh, small and medium enterprises, attracting foreign investment, and strengthening social security and the population. Especially important is the food security of the country, which is ensured mainly through the cultivation and production of domestic agro-industrial product. All these measures have made it possible to ensure steady growth in the sectors of our economy. At the end of 2020 and 2021, the gross domestic product uh, increased by 5.9% uh, and 6.2% respectively, compared to the same period the previous years. All this demonstrates the effectiveness and timeliness of the measures implemented by the government of Turkmenistan to develop a sustainable economic system. Thank you very much. Uh, the economic development of Turkmenistan over the last two years has a trend of stability, given in many respects its existing economic potential. The Turkmenistan government budget in 2020 and 2021 was implemented with a surplus. At the same time, in mid-2020, the government budget was revised towards an increase in spending on health and social services. Uh, the state budget for 2021 and 2022 have been drafted uh, with new realities in mind and provide optimal use for existing potential. It's important that Turkmenistan annually increases wages, pensions, state benefits and stipends by 10%. Since the onset of the pandemic, the country has developed timely fiscal and monetary stimulus measures for sectors of the economy, social protection measures, and measures to maintain financial sector stability. A moratorium on interest payments on previous loans has been introduced. State support is being implemented in terms of maintaining affordable prices and tariffs for public utilities. We have abolished certification of export uh, goods. Turkmenistan has joined the International Convention 
on the simplification and harmonization of customs procedures. The country is also trying to finance sustainable development. In June 2021, the law of Turkmenistan on public-private partnership came into force and a presidential decree on state financial support to entrepreneurs was also adopted. At the same time, in May 2021, we established, with support of the United Resident Coordinator Office in Turkmenistan and the United Nations Development Program, an expert group. Finally, I wanted to say that Turkmenistan will continue to actively strengthen its actions aimed at achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Excellency, for this, uh, for this presentation. We have uh, completed uh, our tour of uh, four countries showing us what were the good practices and the lessons learned and the measures that have been put in place. But to carry on our discussion, I would like to um, invite uh, Mrs. Uh, Kani Wignaraja um, in person. I mean, you can join us, Kani. Um, UN Assistant Secretary General, UNDP Assistant Administrator and Director of the UNDP Regional Bureau for Asia and the Pacific to make an intervention. Kani will be very happy to have you on the floor. Thank you, Valerie, and uh, excellencies and uh, colleagues. Uh, first, thank you to the four esteemed panelists uh, who, as Valerie said, have shared extremely valuable uh, experiences of how their countries are navigating the, this challenging period. We've come through, but also uh, looking, uh, looking forward. I just want to share a few thoughts uh, from uh, our end, both on behalf of the UN and also UNDP. Now, if I think about this region, uh, it is quite amazing that Asia as a whole has lifted a billion people out of poverty. That's no mean feat if you look at the last three decades. At the same time, we live with a skewed contradiction. So we still have, in parts of our region, if I look at South Asia alone, we have 200 million people who live in extreme poverty. And this is something, I mean, if you look at our SIDS, we've heard from our minister uh, in uh, Fiji, uh, they remain hugely vulnerable and increasingly uh, so. So the pandemic has exposed another shock that certainly uh, for me has been devastating. If I look at two countries, in our region, Afghanistan and Myanmar, we have lost 20 years of development progress in just months. So you see how fragile the development gains uh, have, uh, have been. It's almost like an entire country sits just above the line and then a shock just knocks it down uh, so significantly. So what we are figuring out here together is how to stop the slide and to put in place um, a way of moving forward uh, that addresses these challenges much earlier on and hopefully using different ways of going about things. So very uh, quickly, just five quick reflections looking across the region of what we've uh, learned to stop the slide. First, to move to net zero emissions of greenhouse gases. The shift out of fossil fuels is a given. The question is, for each city and each country, is how soon? And that is a bold decision to decarbonize economies that each of you are taking at a different pace and investing in 
uh, at a different scale. Now it is, there's two things we know that work and countries that are using this are moving faster on the decarbonizing agenda. One is access to new technologies and even locally uh, producing the new technologies around renewables. And the second is access to long-term financing. And there we know one needs positive credit ratings and a fiscal space in order to make this happen. But I would even posit that at the front of this is the political commitment, both from leadership and society, to really move sooner rather than later. Uh, there are very few countries, you can count them on one hand in our region, that are actually moving to decarbonize at a pace that will actually make a difference. Second, we have seen that countries that have well-resourced social protection systems, they act as automatic stabilizers. And we've seen this over the last two years. So when economies slump, the countries that have a standing architecture of social safety nets, and those could be a combination of things. We see unemployment and health insurance playing a big role. We see countries that moved with basic income schemes actually holding the bottom up. And we see special benefit programs that have come in to make sure that the most vulnerable in each of our societies don't fall off the edge. These are countries that have seen their people as investments and not as cost. Again, I'm often told, but we don't have the fiscal space. And I often will say back to those leaders, we do. We just make choices of what we invest in. And countries that invest in their people as capability assets then have made a huge difference. And these are the countries you can see the numbers are recovering faster. The third, and I had the, the opportunity to speak with our minister from Sri Lanka on this, who's a leading proponent of universal digital connectivity. This has become, I would say, a, a signal of inclusion and growth for all in countries that are following this, whether it's for education or for commerce. Closing that digital divide really helps all of society to leapfrog. And it's very few things that actually today help countries really leapfrog the way uh, digital economies are helping because they lower the cost of participation, whether it's in local markets or in global markets. So it is an investment that has allowed poorer households when provided this. And, and the big winner is universal, affordable internet access. And it's really, when you look at the cost to your budgets, it is not that much. The benefits are huge. Now to illustrate my fourth reflection, I actually refer to a recent article in The Lancet that analyzed COVID infection rates and deaths for 177 countries over the last two years. And the curious thing, and you know Lancet is a medical journal, they actually came to a very curious um, conclusion that at the end of the day, it was people's trust in scientific expertise in their countries and that trust in government that mattered most when it came to saving lives. A direct correlation, which is really to me um, says a lot because the, the countries in our region that successfully continue to fight this pandemic, you see them at the higher scale of the trust barometer. And I would posit, and I would say that from the UN, we would say this with great confidence, that the power of trust is what will be fundamental to the next generation of governance and leadership that comes through this pandemic and moves forward. Now, a fifth and final reflection is about redressing the under-provision of regional and global public goods. And this has to be done 
with what you are doing here in the room, which is a better coordinated regionalism and new avenues for international cooperation. Regional markets are viable at scale if they propel both public and private sector entities to participate actively in these markets. So while supply chains may be hurting right now, and the tendency is to look inwards, we shouldn't write them off. It is a matter of finding the best local to global mix in these solutions. So as referred in my closing, there is a way forward, and every panelist has spoken uh, to this. Our trade, debt, and financing agreements, if used smartly, will reorient our economies to a new competitiveness, but one that is inclusive and fair. These are not contradictory ends. So we are not done with these extreme challenges, but as the world braces for an even slower economic recovery, those who are overcoming it are those who are moving to a less skewed nature of recovery by giving everyone a chance to make it and stay ahead of this curve. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Kenny. This was very inspiring. Uh, we have a last speaker before we close this session. It's actually um, uh, Mr. Sixin Chen, who is the Vice President overseeing South Asia and Cent Central West Asia operation from ADB. And I would like to invite the intervention. And please, if we can keep it also short, but I don't know. Do we have Mr. Chen online? Yes? Okay. So, Mr. Chen, the floor is yours, and can I please ask you to keep your intervention under three minutes? That would be much appreciated. But we don't see can you. you. Hear me? Can you hear me now? Now we see you and we hear you. Most welcome. Okay. Okay. Okay, Go great. ahead. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm so uh, glad to join you for this uh, very important discussion. Uh, it is the heartening to hear of the efforts on the way to uh, recover uh, from the devastating impacts uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, ADB is uh, committed to helping our developing member countries uh, build back be uh, better towards the SDGs. Uh, we value our partnerships with the U.S. system to accelerate progress in implementing the SDGs and overcoming the setbacks. Uh, we are deepening our support to countries on SDG implementation alongside the work to strengthen uh, uh, national climate uh, action. So let me quickly share uh, three points. First, uh, investing in people. Uh, inclusion and uh, empower are at the heart of uh, SDG framework uh, since the pandemic has uh, highlighted the vulnerabilities of the poorest. Uh, that's why uh, social protection finance has been uh, a focal of our COVID-19 support programs. Uh, we have a long-standing commitment uh, to scale up the finance for these uh, systems, which will continue uh, through post-pandemic recovery. Uh, we have sought to ensure that uh, our COVID-19 response programs targeted the poor and uh, women an uh, estimated 1.1 billion people benefited from support uh, under emergency social protection schemes, at least uh, half of uh, whom were women. Uh, the pandemic enforced, uh, reinforced uh, gender inequalities in our region. Under uh, Asian Development Fund 13, ADB actually created a thematic pool focused on the six targets mm -hmm. of the SDGs 5 transformative uh, agenda, including eliminating uh, violence against women and uh, ensuring uh, women's participation in decision-making and also the leadership. The pandemic uh, disrupted access to education across the region as well, adding to the, a, a pre-existing learning crisis. So ADB supports the diverse learning needs of uh, our region supporting the people's uh, uh, changing lifelong needs. Uh, we aim actually uh, to uh, scaling up uh, our commitments to education sector to approach about 10% of our total 
uh, financing by 2024. Uh, that's leads to my second point, uh, uh, protecting the planet and promoting a green uh, recovery. We also created a thematic pool in support of uh, regional public goods with a focus on environmental protection and sustainable management of shared natural resources, particularly ocean health, biodiversity, and ecosystem services, as well as regional health security. In 2021, we announced our ambition to deliver a cumulative $100 billion in the climate change financed by 2030. Uh, in direct support of SDG, uh, SDG uh, 13 climate action. Uh, in addition, we are committed to aligning 100% uh, of our operations with the goals of the Paris Agreement on climate change. So we have also uh, fostered and participated in uh, growing green bond markets. Since uh, launching in uh, its uh, green bond program in 2015, ADB has uh, raised uh, uh, more than $10 billion to support uh, mitigation and adaptation projects while aiming uh, environmental sustainability. So my uh, uh, third point is the rising to the financing challenges. Many colleagues mentioned that the fiscal challenges uh, created by the pandemic have only uh, added to the imperative to address the macroeconomic and the financial management fundamentals uh, while strengthening the domestic resource mobilization in uh, our uh, DMCs. So adopting a more tailored and cost effective tax incentives and administration system is critical. Tax policy can also be designed to advance the SDGs. For example, governments can uh, adopt a more progressive tax system to address the worsening income inequality due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Carbon and also environmental taxes can also incentivize the green recovery. So these issues are central to our ADB's work. Last year, we launched the new uh, regional hub on domestic resource mobilization and the international tax cooperation. So ADB is also supporting uh, countries to tap the capital markets uh, to meet their financing needs by uh, issuing green, social, and uh, sustainability uh, bonds. Uh, in conclusion, uh, while the future remains uncertain, we are seeing uh, promising signs, as Carl mentioned, of the recovery and the uh, normalization. Uh, ADB estimates the region will see 5.2% growth uh, in this year. We need to channel that uh, growth towards green inclusive and the resilient development, uh, we also need to sustain and maintain multilateral cooperation as we act to create the future we want. Uh, with that, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chen. So with this intervention, we are reaching the end of our session today. We have had a very rich discussion with uh, many different examples that have demonstrated that the region has the experience the capacity and also the, the, the knowledge on how to really lead the transformation that is needed for the sustainable development and especially with a focus on leaving no one behind because leaving no one behind is not only a moral and human uh, imperative and obligation but it is also key to the sustainable development uh, of the region. We also see that we have a roadmap that is very clear with the sustainable development goals. So we have the knowledge, we have the experience, we have the good practices, we have the roadmap. So the, the gelling element in all that, as it has been mentioned by, by Kani, it's the political will. And this collective will that only governments and civil society uh, can gather in order to uh, really respond to uh, the challenges that are ahead of us and to put in place all the policies that are necessary and the institutional capacities uh, to have a successful implementation of the SDGs. So with that, I would like to thank all the honorable ministers and the distinguished uh, speakers who have joined us today and for providing your very valuable insight on the region. It is much appreciated. Thank you very much. And I would like now to hand over the floor back to the chair and thank you so much for, your, for listening. Thank you very much, Ms. Julian, and to our distinguished panelists. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, 
I am pleased now to invite the distinguished delegates to intervene on agenda item two, building back better from COVID-19 while advancing the full implementation of the 2030 agenda in Asia and the Pacific. I will now open the floor to statements from delegates in the speaking order as received from the Secretariat from both participants present in the room and connected through KUDO. I kindly remind delegates to limit their statement to no more than three minutes to allow more delegates the opportunity to speak and please do focus your intervention on the content of the agenda item. I have requested the Secretariat to ring a bell at the, at the three minute mark and in excess of 30 seconds to guide you. I now recognize the distinguished delegate from the Maldives, followed by the distinguished delegate from the Marshall Islands. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, um, it gives me great pleasure to speak at this ninth Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development. Sustainable Development goals are the only thing that sets us on a trajectory that will take us to, the, to a common goal, to a common uh, standard that we all set. And, it's, and I'm glad that most of us have adopted this and are now integrating SDGs into our national development agendas. The Maldives reported its first VNR um, in 2017, and the current government, in its strategic action plan for 2019 to 23, has integrated the SDG goals in the, the action plans and the development uh, um, programs that we have. It's no doubt that pandemic was um, a surprise to all of us. Nobody was prepared for it. Um, there were talks that uh, predictions were made by people that, you know, something like this could happen. But None of us were prepared for it. And it hit us all very badly. And we all reacted to it in ways that, um, you know, we would never have reacted to anything like that in our written history. But what I saw and what we have experienced is that when we are ready to do things, when we believe that this is the way to go forward, the pandemic was a threat to humanity. So we believed that there was an existential threat to, to humanity with the pandemic. So we did unprecedented things, decisions were made. So we when we believe in something, it happens. So believing is the most important thing. If you don't believe, we know a lot of things, but knowing is not believing. We have to be very firm. If we, have, if we believe, we will be committed. We had, we, it was difficult, but we closed down our borders. We shut down our economies. We brought lockdowns to our communities. And the citizens were obedient enough, and then we all followed the rules. And we are still following the rules. Some of us have come out of it. Yes, thank you very much. I can, I can hear that. So believing is what is really important. If we really want to achieve SDGs, we have to believe in this, and then we can do this. There's a lot more I could say on this uh, part of believing. Um, I have an existential threat, like many other small island states, climate change. I'm sure I will have more uh, opportunities during these two, three days to talk about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Excellency and Vice Chair. Let me now call on the distinguished delegate from the Marshall Islands. The floor is yours. Uh, 
Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, Yahweh and greetings from the Marshall Islands. I am honored and privileged to join you virtually on this ninth Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development. The Marshall Islands wishes to first take this opportunity to express our gratitude to the United Nations and its various subsidiaries for the support and continued assistance, especially with the adverse socioeconomic impacts of COVID-19 and climate change to many countries within the region, including the Marshall Islands. The Marshall Islands COVID-19 Preparedness and Response Plan was developed to provide disaster and mitigation preparedness to respond to the impacts of the global pandemic and to revise our national strategic plan with the goal of ensuring resilience from future external shocks and disasters and also to integrate such resilience into our national planning framework that we adopted in 2019. Achievement of universal vaccination against COVID-19 is also vital for the recovery and the Marshall Islands is putting much effort into the vaccination of our citizens. This pandemic has emphasized the vital need for nations to work together on health challenges because truly no one is safe until everyone is safe. This is not just a humanitarian issue, but a medical barrier to curbing the COVID-19 threat for all of us. As a low-lying atoll nation, climate change provides many challenges to our economy and is the greatest threat to our human rights. Not only is it a crisis and a risk multiplier, it also creates a new category of sacrifice zones, which further undermines the right of our people to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. While small islands developing states, or SIDS, contribute less than 1% of greenhouse gas emissions, we are at the front line, experiencing the most disastrous impacts of climate change. This is why national responses alone are not enough to, a safe, to safeguard a healthy environment and why multilateral, multidisciplinary, and multi-stakeholder approaches are needed. In these efforts, collaboration and partnerships are vital. The Marshall Islands delivered our first voluntary national review last year in July, where we highlighted the alignment of the SDGs with the National Strategic Plan, bringing both challenges and opportunities. The major challenges we all share today in our efforts to build back better are not just health issues, but also issues impacting our development, our environment, security, in our human rights. Therefore, RMI's pursuit of aligning our NSP with the 2030 Agenda is key to our sustainable and resilient recovery strategy from the pandemic, the climate crisis, and other challenges. Excellency, regardless of the overwhelming challenges the RMI faces, the government remains vigilant in ensuring that human rights are universal and that the processes and institutions in the country that exist to promote and protect them must be inclusive and enjoyed by all. The Marshall Islands continually aims to protect marginalized groups, enforce anti-discrimination, and promote gender equality. Women and girls have the same opportunity to participate and be involved in all areas of society, which also includes roles at the highest levels of government, as can be made evident during many of the government's participation in local, regional, and multilateral events. The RMI strongly believes that educating society to be inclusive with no one left behind is key in our capacity building, understanding and addressing the many challenges we face to ensure a better future for ourselves, our nation, and for generations yet to come. The Marshall Islands wishes to take this opportunity to reaffirm our stance to continue to engage constructively with all states, UNESCO, and all other UN organizations in furthering the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. We believe that the road to recovery from this pandemic, the climate crisis, and all other challenges can be achieved by working together in our shared pursuit for peace and prosperity for our people and the planet now and into the future. Thank you very much, uh, Excellency. Distinguished delegates and participants, we have now reached the end of the time allotted for this session. We sincerely apologize to the delegations who have not yet been given the floor 
I invite them to deliver their statement when we resume the agenda item two this afternoon. Agenda item two will continue in this afternoon session from 1400 hours. His Excellency Mohammed Aslam, Minister of National Planning, Housing and Infrastructure of the Maldives, as Vice Chair of the Forum, will guide the deliberations this afternoon. Once the meeting is adjourned, may I encourage the distinguished delegates to join the launch of the SDG Partnership Report scheduled over lunch break. There are also other side events which you may wish to attend. The list of side events, including their registration details, have been posted on the meeting website. I kindly request you to return to the meeting by 1400 hour. Allow me now to close this morning session and thank you all for your contributions and for an excellent segment. I now invite the secretary to make some housekeeping announcements. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, excellencies, distinguished delegates, uh, as kindly informed by the Chair, we will start with the launch of the SDG Partnership Report uh, in a few minutes here in this SCAP Hall. Please do note that there will be no interpretation facilities for this session. Um, there are also three side events running in parallel during this lunch break hosted by different member states, UN entities and other partners on key topics uh, to the theme of the forum. If you could kindly refer to the SCAP website uh, and you will see registration links and how to access the side events. For delegates physically present, please be informed that there is an international cafe on the first floor of the UNCC building. In addition, you can find the Ratchapurik lounge located on the ground floor of the building which serves various light meals, pastries, coffees, and uh, coffee and beverages. We will meet again here at SCAP Hall on via Kudo at two o'clock to resume agenda item two. Um, we'd be grateful for your cooperation to make sure that we can keep this time schedule. Um, so please enjoy the launch session and other side events. Thank you very much.
Excellent. Uh, excellencies, distinguished delegates, may I kindly request you to proceed to your seats as the forum will resume shortly. I would now like to invite the Bureau and panelists to the rostrum. Vice Chair of the 9th APFST, His Excellency Mohammed Aslam, Minister of National Planning, Housing and Infrastructure, Maldives. I will now hand over the floor to His Excellency Mr. Mohammed Aslam to proceed with the forum. Excellency. Thank you. Good afternoon, Excellencies, distinguished delegates. I hope you had a pleasant lunch and enjoyed uh, the side event. I call this meeting to order. Would like to express my sincere appreciation and gratitude to you for electing me to serve on the Bureau. I also would like to thank the Chair and the Vice Chairs for the close collaboration. Before we continue with the proceeding of the agenda item 2B, building back better from COVID-19 while advancing the fulfillment, the full implementation of the 2030 agenda in Asia and the Pacific, we would like to resume with statements from delegations pertaining to the previous agenda item 2A. I will open the floor to statements from delegates in the speaking order as received from the Secretariat, from both participants present in the room and connected through KUDO. I kindly remind delegates to limit their statements to no longer than three minutes length to allow all delegates the opportunity to speak and to focus their interventions on the content of the agenda item. I now give the floor to the delegate from Secretariat of the Conference on the Interaction and Confidence Building Measures in Asia, CICA, followed by the delegate from Philippines. The delegate from Secretariat of the Conference on the Secretariat of the Conference on the Interaction and Conference Building Parties in Asia, you have the floor now. Thank you, Chair. May I make my presentation from the seat. It is no objection. Thank you. It is with a great pleasure that I accepted the invitation of His Excell Her Excellency Ms. Armida Alice Jabana, Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Executive Secretary of ESCAP, to attend the 9th Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development. It is also a great honor to address today's panel, along with high ranking politicians and prominent experts, and participate in this well rounded exchange of views. I wish to highlight the important role the Conference on Interaction and Confidence Building Measures in Asia, SICA in short, is playing in promoting peace, stability, and security through enhancing dialogue, cooperation, and partnerships among Asian nations, including through implementation of global SDGs amid the current challenges and evolving security architecture. This year, SICA, which currently embraces 27 member states, covering more than 90% of Asia, as well as 19 observers and partners from Asia, Europe, and North America, is celebrating its 30th anniversary. Thanks to its broad membership and comprehensive mandate, SICA represents a unique convening and uniting power. It provides a multilateral platform where states with rather diverse political, economic, and sociocultural systems and backgrounds meet on an equal footing, exchange views, share experience and best practices, join efforts in mutually beneficial projects and take decisions on the basis of consensus. Our philosophy aims at creating and expanding common security space through joint implementation of confidence-building measures in five broad dimensions, 
including in the area of sustainable development. We pursue a holistic and comprehensive approach to strengthening peace and security. SICA member states' joint practical activities carried out on a voluntary basis are meant to develop their relations in an exceeding trajectory from interaction to better understanding, which is in turn builds trust and confidence, facilitates dialogue and strengthens cooperation. This is SICA's way of contributing to indivisible security in Asia and providing necessary condition for an effective implementation of SDGs. At the last SICA ministerial meeting in Nur Sultan last October, all 27 SICA member states have reiterated their commitment to accelerating the implementation of 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development of the United Nations and its Sustainable Development Goals based on national policies of each member state, improving the quality of life of member states' population, sharing the best international practices of development, and promoting stronger, healthier, and more sustainable global development. Furthermore, all SICA member states recognize the importance of strengthening cooperation in the field of environmental protection, mitigation of, and adaptation to climate change, emergency management, sustainable energy transition, sustainable water management, biodiversity con conservation, and fostering harmonious common life of humans and nature. All SICA member states welcome global efforts to address climate change, including to stimulate green investment and financing, reduce all polluting emissions into the atmosphere, support the transformation of carbon intensive industries through deployment of clean technologies, while taking into account the development policies and priorities of countries. All our member states recognize the need for more global attention to mobilize means of implementation, especially implementing the commitment of developed countries to provide $100 billion financial support to developing countries annually. SICA's main event of 2022 is the sixth SICA summit in October in Nur Sultan, Kazakhstan. SICA today is on the verge of transformation into full-fledged international organization for regional security and cooperation in Asia. SICA is perfectly placed to meet and need the need for strengthened connectivity in the Asian continent, including stronger economic, financial, transport, and people-to-people -people links in the SICA region and beyond. Today, connectivity in Asia becomes even more acute in light of the newly emerging gaps and breakdowns in the world economic system, which directly affect all SICA member states. The development of green and digital economies is a powerful driver of economic prosperity and progress for all mankind. SICA has the potential to expand its ties with UN ESCAP and other relevant regional organizations and stakeholders on sustainable development, as well as other vital spheres of regional cooperation. SICA Secretariat would welcome ESCAP's expertise, which would contribute significantly to further enhancing the SICA process and implementation of relevant confidence-building measures. I thank you. Thank you. Um, I understand I announce uh, the distinguished delegates from Philippines uh, as the next uh, speaker, but I understand uh, we'll have to postpone that. Um, I now invite the distinguished delegate from Papua New Guinea, followed by the distinguished delegate from India. I would remind the delegates to keep the statements to three minutes strictly. We are still continuing from a previous session. Thank you. Uh, uh, distinguished delegate from Papua New Guinea, you have the floor. Uh, good afternoon, Jim. Madam Secretary, Excellencies, Distinguished uh, Delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor to deliver this statement on behalf of the government and the people of Papua New Guinea under the theme Building the Black Status from COVID 19. While advancing the full implementation of the 2030 agenda in Asia and the Pacific, the theme is timely for this given the continuous challenges posed by COVID-19, which has impeded much of our efforts to progress the 2000-2030 agenda for sustainable development. Excellencies, two years ago, and the, COVID and the coronavirus disease pandemic 
disrupt the lives of people everywhere, letting a lot of countries and the economic stress, particularly the least developed and developing states, derailing our sustainable regional and national in an effort to rescue the economy of the accumulated within the space of two years without to deal with the impact of the And there was this fun set of programs. The recent survey approach have also indicated that at least a developed and developing countries impacted as most programs and projects for many areas or slow down due to those issues coupled with restrictions and protect and protectionism measures imposed by other countries. Papua New Guinea, like other developing states of the Asia Pacific, has been severely affected and social impacts of the and exploitating poor social and economic outcomes. Overall, our efforts to progress and set the agenda for sustainable development have been hindered by the COVID-19 and reverses sustainable progress in the last year. Excellencies, government efforts are not sufficient to the impact impacts brought by the COVID-19 pandemic. Let me use this occasion to regional and sub-regional and organizations valuable and continue in leading efforts that are vital in sharing ideas, information and best practice to address many of the same issues and programs. But it is also great it continues to receive from bilateral development partners through technical assistance and grants and assistance in providing intervention programs, lessons, lessons for the economy. Through the support of the Australian government, the SIE benefits from the two COVID-19 response programs, vulnerability and the economic and a physical crisis countries facing severe physical a total of 102 million Australian dollars which 15 million was gone for the economic recovery window and 87 million for the as budgetary support Funding programs that are out for areas. Excellencies, development and pilot we identified social experience that concessional laws to strengthen the social and drive economic recovery. In, in closing, time role the UN system in the ESCAP in assisting member states in the Asia Pacific region towards building a better, better from the coronavirus disease pandemic, accelerate the progress of implementing sustainable development goals. Particularly remains committed to the in the region to support our national efforts and reiterate our commitment to the regional cooperation in the region. I thank you. Thank you. Um, I now give the floor to the distinguished delegate from India, followed by the distinguished delegate from Bangladesh. Um, once again, I remind. Uh, that uh, please stick to the three minute three minutes time limit. Um, distinguished delegate from India, you have the floor.
um, to us is um, distinguished delegate from India coming online. I can see India here presence in the hall. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, please proceed. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's an honor to represent. I, I hear an echo, Mr. Chair. I couldn't quite get it. Uh, uh, can you repeat, please? Uh, Mr. Chair, there is an echo. Uh, no, it's not. It's quite fine. The sound is quite fine here. All right. Um, thank you once again, Mr. Chair. It's an honor to represent the country's statement uh, for India, and I congratulate the countries of the region for the remarkable action against the global pandemic. On its part, since onset of the pandemic two years ago, India has introduced and successfully implemented an array of initiatives to mitigate the spread and impact of COVID-19. The Prime Minister's Garib Kalyan package announced in March 2020 has been the flagship government effort in this regard. The package includes insurance coverage of 5 million rupees uh, for health workers, subsidized food drinks for 800 million people, direct benefit costs for 200 million women, increase the wage rate under the job guarantee program, which will benefit 46 million families, financial support for single citizens and widows, and a minimum income for over 37 million farmers. Under India's successful COVID-19 vaccination rollout, 1.8 billion doses have been administered. India has now crossed the milestone of fully vaccinating over 80% of its adult population. Our vaccination efforts extend beyond our borders. Under the Vaccine Maitri Initiative, India has supplied over 162 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines to other countries, championing regional cooperation and multilateralism. Mr. Chair, India was determined to change the pandemic crisis into an opportunity and under the Atman Nirbhar Bharat, we are no self-reliant India movement through the five pillars of economy, infrastructure, inform systems and technologies and vibrant democracy and demand initiatives for self-reliance. We've been able to bring about the transformative changes. Achieving the target set under the 2030 agenda is imperative for India to meet the aspirations of its large, young and vibrant population. And India has adopted model of a cooperative and competitive federalism implemented through a whole of society approach to drive the SDG achievements. Focus action in the area of basic infrastructure and health and nutrition have delivered impressive outcomes. 331 million more people have gained access to improved sanitation. 233 million more people have gained access to clean cooking fuel and electricity coverage has improved to 97%. Health coverage programs cover 500 million people. India remains deeply committed to global uh, to climate action. Our commitment to become a net zero emission by 2070 of building 50% renewable energy capacity by 2030 with 400 gigawatts. Our resolve to a 45% reduction in carbon intensity and a cut down in carbon emissions by 1 billion tons by 2030 are examples of strong action. We call for action that matches their commitment from the high income nations also. Uh, India will continue to use this uh, SDG framework as our principal development agenda and engage with multiple stakeholders for accelerating progress towards achieving the SDGs. As a, a region, we must remind ourselves that our political action in the next eight years will be instrumental to the aspirations and ambitions of our future generations. This alone should motivate us to do our best. I thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, may I now give the floor to the distinguished delegate from Bangladesh, followed by the distinguished delegate from Philippines. Uh, respected Chair, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, good afternoon. At the outset, on behalf of Bangladesh delegation, I would like to thank the UNSK for organizing the 9th Asia-Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development. Bangladesh, being one of the densely populated countries in the world, is now undergoing a period of double transition. It ended 
It entered into the LMIC's group in 2015 and at the UNG recently adopted a resolution for Bangladesh to be graduated from the LDCs in 2026. It revealed the sustained and inclusive growth in social, economic and biosphere in Bangladesh, particularly in the last 13 years under the dynamic and visionary leadership of our Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. In this backdrop, the UN sponsored Sustainable Development Solution Network in September 21 conferred her with the SDG Progress Award. The government has approved its flagship strategic document, the 8-5 year plan, which has incorporated all the targets of SDGs in a befitting way. The government has been following the whole of the society approach to implement the SDGs. Localization of SDGs has given more emphasis in the country by identifying 40 priority indicators to be implemented at the local levels. Despite the country has witnessed three decade low economic growth in financial year 1920, because of the dire consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic, the average GDP growth in the last 13 years have been 6.3%. The provisional growth estimate for financial year 21 is 6.94, which along with other macroeconomic indicators reveal that the economy is turning around. Credits goes to government's rightly intervention on some strategies, policies, and implementation of different stimulus packages amounting to 5.3% of GDP. The spending on social protection along with uh, coverage have been increased in recent years. The allocation for current year is 3% of GDP. The government has widened the coverage of the old age allowances by including all eligible persons in 50% sub district in the country. Our tested development partners have extended their cooperation through providing budget support, which has helped us to, co to overcome the crisis. With the ceaseless efforts of government and support from COVAX, more than 76% of the total population has been vaccinated in the country. The challenges, however, is very prominent in the education sector, as all educational institutions remain closed for more than one and a half years. Recently, education sector has prepared and approved COVID-19 response and recovery plan. The government of Bangladesh concurrently cele celebrated the golden jubilee of independence of and sentinel birth anniversary of father of the nation, Bangladesh Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, terming it Mujib year. During the Mujib year, the 100% access to electricity has been declared. Bangladesh has launched Mujib Climate Prosperity Plan 2030, which will leverage the financing of the 85 year plan, Vision 2041, and Bangladesh Delta Plan to unlock the potentials for a fast track delivery of the SDGs by 2030. The COVID-19 pandemic has made it difficult for developing countries to achieve the SDGs by 2030. We would urge more regional cooperation to accelerate SDGs in inter- and inter-regional trade and prepare trade, uh, paperless trade, easier connectivity through Asian highways, Asian railway, dry ports, and investment networking through public-private partnership. Our Honorable Prime Minister owns the SDGs. She has been implementing some people-centric transformational projects, which after completion will change the social and economic spheres of the country. I thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Chairman, uh, Chairman I, would like to, I would like to ask you not to ring the bell directly next to the microphone. By the distinguished delegate from Republic of Indonesia. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, excellencies, distinguished delegates, honorable guests, and colleagues, good afternoon. So today we tackle the theme, building back better from COVID-19 while advancing the full implementation of the 2030 agenda in Asia and the Pacific. As one of the top three or top five countries in the World Disaster Risk Index, <laughs> The Philippines is no stranger to the term building back better. In fact, we have an institutionalized response to calamities. Building back better is the operational term which invokes images of uh, destroyed houses, structures, infrastructures, and then building back up, but better. The planning principle, however, is getting back on track. It's to fix the train, the rails, and then get them back on track. And with the recent COVID-19 experience, we think that this is actually the more appropriate imagery actually to portray because it's about fixing the train and the rails, making them sturdy and get the trains to move back on track and onwards. And easy to say, but very difficult to get done, especially if the train and the rails have sustained huge damage and much of it is invisible to the naked eye. At this point, it is critical 
that we examine our common areas of cooperation, like one, ensuring that recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic would be inclusive, two, achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and three, shaping a sustainable Asia-Pacific. We can then explore the following actions in shaping the future of our region. Number one, let's foster a resilient communities by supporting research and development and innovation geared towards a healthy, inclusive, and sustainable region. The twin threats of extreme natural disasters and the ongoing pandemic are overwhelming our already overstretched institutions. And collaborating to rethink and redesign existing systems and institutions with health and well being at the core is a necessity. Moreover, these innovations need to be accessible and affordable to all. Number two, create a resilient and inclusive economy by narrowing the digital divide. The pandemic accelerated the adoption and integration of new and emerging digital technologies. These technologies actually made it possible for life and business to persist, to continue, despite the barriers to mobility. However, this option was accessible to only 4.95 billion people, or approximately 60% of the world's population. It is therefore critical to close this digital divide and, and important to this is actually addressing the pro providing more digital infrastructure and promoting digital literacy. And this will increase accessibility and the availability of the internet and internet related technologies. Number three is to establish an effective platform for, mu for multi-sectoral partnerships. The unprecedented scale of disruptions and challenges requires innovative solutions, including partnerships that transcend industry, function, and sector. Critical to these partnerships are mechanisms that facilitate faster and smoother communication, uh, coordination, and collaboration, quickly establishing a trusted source of truth. That will allow us to work together and learn from each other in our goal of strengthening our region's resilience to all kinds of disaster. As Asia Pacific begins to emerge from this debilitating aftermath of the pandemic, we find ourselves at a critical juncture to shape the future of our region. And today, we gather to reaffirm our commitment to work together in achieving a common goal of a stronger and more sustainable Asia Pacific. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. May I now call upon the delegate, uh, distinguished delegate from Republic of Indonesia to be followed by the distinguished delegate from Russian Federation. Thank you, Chair. In this decade of action for SDGs achievement in 2030, we focus on accelerating and working together to ensure the principle of inclusiveness and no one is left behind. COVID-19 pandemic has deceleration Indonesia's achievement in poverty reduction. The national poverty levels conceded to us three years ago, where within one year, the number of poor increased by 2.7 million people. The vulnerable groups are among the most affected. The number of poor people could have been larger, around 5.2 million people, if the government did not intervene through extensive social assistance. This effort has also succeeded in reducing poverty to 9.7% in 2021. In 2022, Indonesia continues to push for economic recovery and transformation post-pandemic. The government seeks collaboration to develop innovative financing through green taxonomy, the sustainable financing system, the issue of SDGs bond and green suco, IDX ESG leader, Sharia ecosystem synergy, Indonesia impact fund, standard sustainable development and better life, INLF and SDGs investor mapping. Pandemic has also disrupted the quality of education. Adequate tools and materials are the main prerequisite for the success of student learning at home. Government of Indonesia's effort to increase the quality of education services 
by providing better internet network infrastructure and strengthening digital technology support virtual learning. Indonesia's priorities in 2022 are so related to elevate human resources development that will be emphasized on system reform, national health, accelerated reduction in material mortality and stunting, and vocational education and training for industry 4.0. The skill, creative, innovative, and adaptive workers are needed to increase Indonesia's competitiveness toward global megatrend challenges. During pandemic, the workload and time burden for women responsibilities in the household is significantly heavier. Moreover, women who are working in health and social care sectors are prone to COVID-19. Government of Indonesia has been implementing gender responsive budget allocation to promote the achievement of gender equality. Indonesia gears up through the implementation of a green economy and has adopted circular economy into national medium term development plan 2020-2024 as a part of low carbon development strategy as well as focus on climate resiliency by strengthening convergence between disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. Indonesia also has President Regulation Number 19 Year 2021 related to carbon economic value policy as an initiative for sustainable finance and to support the SDGs achievement. We also continue to push green fiscal stimulus as our sustainable recovery. In the justice and governance dimension, utilization of digitalization is one of the priorities to implement good governance as to accelerate the effort to fighting corruption. The government also will continue to encourage open and good governance related to the ease of investing in Indonesia by prioritizing the issue of investment and sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you. May I now invite the distinguished delegate from Russian Federation uh, to be followed by a collective statement on behalf of civil society at the People's Forum. Um, distinguished delegate from Russian Federation, you have the floor. Chairman, distinguished participants of the forum, Russia highly appreciates the activity of ESCAP to support a broad dialogue on sustainable development in Asia Pacific and greater assistance to countries in the region to uh, achieve the SDGs. The theme of today's session is uh, highly um, timely. Unfortunately, the world is still dealing with the major challenges and threats, such as uh, the factor of COVID-19. And uh, we still have a great disparity in development levels within countries and uh, among them, which prevents the full activation of existing capacities for Agenda 2030. APFSD, we, in our belief, must give the possibility to delineate new measures to enable uh, our overcoming the negative tendencies in the implementation of Agenda 2030. We welcome the efforts of the Secretariat to support countries in terms of achieving the SDGs as well as the preparation of reports on Agenda 2030. It's important to insist on inclusivity in the Agenda 2030 context. And this is our approach in Russia. And it is in this sense that we shall continue uh, contributing uh, positively to the work of the various uh, specialized agencies of uh, the UN in addition to other organizations relevant uh, in this region, such as EAEU, Shanghai Organization, APEC, etc. Russia has been a major donor uh, having supported the implement implementation of more than 40 projects of the Commission. And uh, we plan to continue uh, this participation. We are committed to the implementation of tw Agenda 2030. We have uh, a regulatory framework in the form of a 
a government approved conception for transition to sustainable development. And the data that we have so far show that we are doing pretty well for all the SDGs that are under scrutiny at this uh, APFSD. This applies to SDGs 4, 15, 17 in particular. I would like uh, briefly to mention some of our achievements. More information in detail can be handed over to the Secretariat. Over the past couple of years, we opened uh, more than 300 schools that can uh, take in over 200,000 students. In particular, attention is uh, paid uh, to the um, school network for special needs children. We have a special strategy for uh, the for women for the period 2017-2022 in terms of uh, the implementation of the principles of equal rights and liberties between men and women. We also have uh, a whole network of special protection natural territories, and some of them fall within the territories of UNESCO uh, World Heritage Sites. We also work actively with the, the private sector and we have a special forum where um, representatives of all the major sectors of the private sector take part in our discussions. And this system has also already proven to be very useful. In conclusion, I'd like brief, briefly to mention COVID-19. The pandemic has not been overcome yet. It is important to continue working actively to resolve systemic issues in the fields of health and social protection. We have in mind in particular mutual recognition of vaccines, access to vaccines, validation of COVID certificates, etc. If these issues are not resolved, we should not count on effective recovery through building back better. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. May I once again remind the delegates to stick to the three minutes time limit. Uh, I now give the floor to the uh, delegate, distinguished delegate, to give the statement on behalf of civil society at the People's Forum. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, excellencies and colleagues, I join all of you in congratulating the SCAP on its 75th anniversary. I am representing Farmers Constituency and bringing a collective message from the People's Forum of the Asia-Pacific CSOs, which was concluded on 25th uh, March. I was slated to uh, speak in the last session. Therefore, I would uh, like to briefly reflect on the theme of the last session's panel. And we civil society organizations come across scores of innovative and sustainable solutions across uh, varieties of regions like sustainable agriculture and food, education, climate resilient uh, practices, community-based disaster risk reduction, uh, improving early warning systems, making more uh, people's access towards health services and harvesting traditional knowledge from indigenous peoples and women and mixing them with the modern science. Uh, they persevere to be recognized, to be supported and to be scaled up and similarly, we also persevere here to be recognized session after session. So my uh, humble pray and request that uh, my colleagues will be, who are slated to speak later will not uh, become a, 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 a subject of uh, lack of time. So thank you for giving space to me. Uh, Chair and Excellencies, majority of the countries in the region have witnessed unsustainable mounting sovereign debts and increasing IFI conditionality and increased illicit financial flow and shrinking ODA and access to trade, as well as uh, thereby losing fiscal and policy space and are struggling for recovery. The onerous trade agreements with provisions like ISDS are further bleeding states with impunity. The crisis has induced increased corporatization and hegemonization of the natural resources through slew of neoliberal policies dilution of environmental and social safeguards, social protection has further weakened and women's unpaid care work has increased many folds. 
scarce jobs have led to further exploitation of labor. For many millions, the advent of the decade of action uh, seems like a uh, false dawn. The region is also worst at the worst receiving end of the runaway climate crisis and disasters, rapid biodiversity loss and air pollution as well as plastic pollution. While the resources are scarce for making sustainable and resilient comeback from the crisis, uh, the region is also witnessing increased militarization and ever-looming threat of conflict and war. The recent aggression has the effect of legitimizing possession of nuclear weapon as a de deterrence, which does not bode well for the region. Establishment of peace remains a sine qua non for achieving the agenda in the region. Uh, in specific, we recommend to address following critical factors urgently, address systemic barriers and focus on the bottom of the pyramid, address regional priorities of climate change and disaster, rapid, rapid biodiversity loss, air and plastic pollution and migration, strengthen peer learning process at sub-regional and national levels. Uh, finally, it's the time to make decisions that makes transformative changes and uses inclusive multilateralism and high ambitions so that we can achieve Agenda 2030 in our own lifetimes, which I agree, which I think all of you will agree. Thank you so much. Thank you. May I now invite the distinguished delegate from Thailand to be followed by a statement by UN Desa. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Excellencies, distinguished delegates. Thailand thanks ESCAP for organizing this regional forum. Earlier this morning, the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Foreign Affairs of Thailand has touched on some key issues in navigating the SDG in the current global landscape. I therefore would like to highlight a few points. First, as we build back from the COVID-19 pandemic, it is important that we take balanced approach in all dimensions. In Thailand, the concept of balance has special resonance owing to the Sufficiency Economy Philosophy, or SAP, our homegrown development approach. Building on the SAP, Thailand aims to promote the biocircular and green economy model that leverages countries' rich biodiversity and national resources. With the BCG economy model, Thailand is working closely with 20 economies in Asia Pacific to promote a more resilient, inclusive, and green growth as we host APEC this year. On environmental front, Thailand is pleased that the fifth UN Environment Assembly held earlier this month adopted a landmark resolution to begin negotiations on a legally binding instrument concerning plastic pollution. At the national level, Thailand has a roadmap on plastic waste management, which aims to recycle our plastic waste and, re and reduce marine debris by at least 50% by 2027. On VNR, Thailand submitted its second VNR at the HLPF last July. The VNR drafting process provided us with an opportunity to engage with different stakeholders, including youth, civil society, academia, private sector, and national assembly. Thailand also recently established co subcommittee on youth and private sector under the National Committee for Sustainable Development as mechanisms to engage these two important sectors in the SDG implementation. And finally, Thailand recognizes that volunteers play a crucial part in SDG implementation, especially in our national experience. And internationally, the Thailand International Cooperation Agency continues to dispatch volunteers to work with partner countries in development projects. We look forward to the regional launch of the State of the World's Volunteerism Report this evening. I thank you. Thank you. Uh, may I now invite uh, distinguished delegate uh, to give the statement on behalf of UN Desa to be followed by to be followed by Japan.
I don't think uh, that we have you and Dessa here, although it's on the list. Uh, may I then invite the distinguished delegate from Japan to be followed by the distinguished delegate from Malaysia. Thank you, Chair. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, COVID-19 has posed further challenges to re reaching the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, by 2030. In overcoming the crisis, the principle of leaving no one behind and the notion of human security, which focuses on the most vulnerable, are the key principles in Japan's action to achieve the SDGs. In February this year, in, co in cooperation with UNDP, a special report on human security was released. With this report, Japan will further disseminate the notion and promote discussions on human security at the UN with new data and analysis. As an essential area for promoting human security, Japan places great importance on supporting education. At last year's World Summit on Education, Japan pledged over 1.5 billion to the education sector over the next five years. In light of the severe impact of COVID-19 on girls' education, Japan will continue to support the education of at least 7.5 million girls in developing countries by providing math education, learning opportunity for children who have missed learning and skills training to help them improve their income. Japan has also been supporting women and girls affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. For instance, in the Asia Pacific region, in cooperation with UN women, throughout the last year in Bangladesh, Indonesia, and the Philippines. And Myanmar, Japan has provided livelihood support through the production and the provision of daily supplies to prevent infection. Furthermore, for the past two years in Thailand and Bangladesh, Japan has provided livelihood support to women affected by the current crisis and the same measures were taken in rural areas in Papua New Guinea, where women make livings from selling agricultural products. Excellencies, on the occasion of 50th anniversary of ASEAN-Japan Friendship and Cooperation in 2023, we will continue to promote substantial cooperation with ASEAN on the ASEAN Outlook on the Indo-Pacific, which shares essential principles with the free and open in the Pacific and has the SDGs as one of the key areas for cooperation to take ASEAN-Japan relationships to new heights. Moreover, last year, the first Japan Mekong SDGs forum was held, hosted jointly by the government of Thailand and Japan. Relevant ministries and agencies from the Mekong countries in Japan, as well as officials from WHO, UNEP, IGES attended the forum and exchanged views. Japan intends to continue promoting the SDGs in the Mekong region under the Japan Mekong Initiative for SDGs toward 2030 in order to make the region more sustainable, diverse, and inclusive. I thank you. Thank you. May I now invite the distinguished delegate from Malaysia uh, to be followed by the distinguished delegate from the Republic of Korea. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, we live in a world of rapid changes that is so profound that no country can stand alone. The world interlink threats and challenges require everyone to share responsibility and contribute to a common vision. Hence, multi-stakeholder partnerships are crucial to leverage the interlinkages between the SDGs to enhance their effectiveness, impact and accelerate progress in achieving the goals. In Malaysia, adoption of a whole of nation approach is imperative in bringing our goals closer to achievement. There has been a lot of comprehensive multi-stakeholder engagement and collaboration between the public and private sectors, particularly in drafting the Malaysia Voluntary National Review last year. This helped us gain better perspective on the nation's performance, 
as well as identifying gaps and challenges in implementing SDGs. We believe that forging strong partnerships is important to ensure buy-in from all relevant parties. Mr. Chair, ladies and gentlemen, Malaysia cushions the impact of COVID-19 pandemic by introducing a number of economic stimulus packages, totaling about 530 billion Malaysia ringgit, with the focus, among others, on the most vulnerable groups. This includes providing social assistance to support the bottom 40% and the middle income household, as well as supporting employment retention programs. The stimulus packages were also aimed to help the micro, small and medium enterprises, the largest group hardest by hit by the pandemic. Our experience shows that timely, quality, easily accessible and this aggregated data is critical in understanding, managing and mitigating the social and economic impact of pandemic. Reliable and timely statistics are important in designing short-term responses and long-term planning to enable countries build back better and achieve the 2030 agenda. In addition, the development of the SDG indicators at national level, the Department of Statistics of Malaysia has also published My Local Stat, which displays key economic statistics at district and state level. With the publication of My Local Stat, states and local government are able to assess their performance, identifying gaps and projects produce the voluntary local review reports. This supports SDG localization, which has been given much emphasis in the National Development Plan, particularly to accelerate the SDG. We hope that UN and other member countries continue to share their best practices, knowledge and technical expertise through capacity building to accelerate our action in real realizing the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, may I now invite the distinguished delegate from the Republic of Korea to be followed by United State, uh, Cities and Local Government, Local Governments Asia Pacific. Uh, may I also announce that uh, we intend to finish this session by three o'clock. We are already late by an hour uh, for item 2B. Um, so if there are, and there will be, um, more delegates uh, from um, the previous session, they will continue into the session after the, the next session. Um, that, that starts at, uh, after agenda item three. Um, so may I now invite uh, the distinguished delegate from the Republic of Korea to be followed by the United St Cities, local governments, Asia Pacific. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let me first congratulate the 75th anniversary of ESCOP, and I would like to express my deep gratitude to the ESCOP Secretariat for organizing this meaningful gathering, which gives us a timely opportunity to reflect on where we stand in our journey to achieve the SDGs and to reaffirm our firm comm commitment to dissent. With more than two years into the pandemic, we're still struggling to bring our life back to normal. The pandemic has not only reversed heart one gains, but also push the most vulnerable further to the brink of extreme poverty, inequality, and unemployment, making them to face even more challenging situations than ever before. The Asia and Pacific region is not an exception. Today's meeting, therefore, is indeed important in that it brings us together to share invaluable experiences and insights to move towards our shared goal of building back better from COVID-19 while advancing the full implementation of the 2030 agenda. Given such context, I would like to make some points. First, ensuring an inclusive, sustainable, and resilient recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic should be our goal while the effort to bring an end to the pandemic continues. Under the Building Trust ODA initiative launched in 2020, the Republic of Korea has contributed to strengthening our partner country's readiness and capacity to prepare for, cope with, and adapt to any future shocks beyond providing support for immediate response to the current pandemic. As well, the Republic of Korea is taking an active part in the COVAX facility to ensure equitable access and distribution of vaccines and actively engaging in the ongoing efforts 
to improve the global health structure, including the strengthening of the international health regulations. Second, it is incumbent on all of us to redouble our efforts to build a more inclusive green economies. The Republic of Korea has already submitted its 2050 carbon neutrality vision with an ambitious 2030 NDC. And we have declared a suspension of new domestic coal power plants, as well as the discontinuation of public financial support for overseas coal power plants. On top of such ambitious goal last year, the Republic of Korea adopted Green New Deal ODA strategy, which will shape its efforts to assist partners with their transition to a low carbon economy and facilitate the collaboration with the GCF and GGGI in this regard. Third, multi-stakeholder partnerships need to be enhanced. Framework Act on Sustainable Development, which will enter into force this upcoming July, is a reflection of efforts of the government of the Republic of Korea to effectively mainstream and integrate SDGs into national policies, plans, and strategies. In particular, the Act stipulates the creation of a platform where the voices of diverse stakeholders can be heard in the process of implementing the 2030 Agenda. It is believed that the platform will indeed serve as a meaningful mechanism to explore collective wisdom in our journey to leaving no one behind. Mr. Chair, I would like to conclude by rendering the Republic of Korea strong support for ASCOP's continued leadership in catalyzing the collective action of all stakeholders in the region toward the 2030 agenda. I thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, next will be the last statement from uh, um, the, the session we were continuing, um, and that will be the statement from United St Cities and Local Governments, Asia Pacific. There are nine more statements uh, that has to be postponed um, after the, the item number three. Um, so I give the floor to the distinguished delegate to give the statement on United, uh, behalf of United Cities and Local Governments Asia Pacific. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, for uh, the opportunity. Uh, the Excellencies, uh, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, very uh, good uh, afternoon, good morning, greetings from UCAG ASPAC Secretariat uh, here in Jakarta. First, allow me to congratulate UNESCAP for the 75th anniversary, and I really like to compliment the good work that uh, UNESCAP has, has been doing. I speak on behalf of the organized constituencies of the local authorities uh, represented uh, by the Asia Pacific Local uh, Government Coordinating Body or APLG. APLG. Two years uh, into the pandemic demonstrated the pivotal role of local governments or sub-national governments uh, in uh, building back better from this uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, and advancing the implementation of uh, 2030 agenda uh, for sustainable development uh, in this uh, uh, region. And um, this also includes uh, social protection measures, uh, vaccination, um, uh, economic uh, recovery initiative uh, were mostly undertaken uh, at the local uh, level. So local governments are not just arms uh, that implement the 2030 agenda. Local governments are at the very heart uh, of its implementation. Uh, and uh, the recovery from uh, COVID-19 as uh, we align uh, short-term emergency responses uh, with long-term uh, development plans and strategies. Uh, in uh, as much as we strive uh, to do more for our people, local governments need support uh, from national governments, stakeholders, and the international community. Several local governments in the region, uh, given the reduced uh, economic activity due to the pandemic, uh, experienced huge drop uh, uh, in local revenue. Budget have also been realigned to address uh, the immediate healthcare needs uh, in the community. So we would like to call, we call on our national governments and the international community to provide access to financing uh, mechanism to restore uh, fiscal stability in the local governments. Political, social, environmental landscapes uh, continue uh, to evolve in the face of several challenges by, uh, faced by uh, this uh, urbanization in the region, climate change, the pandemic, among many others. 
So to keep uh, up with these challenges, uh, local governments must be equipped, uh, equipped uh, not only with resources, but capabilities as well. So we commend the Asia Pacific Mayors Academy as one of the regional initiative to equip uh, newly elected uh, officials uh, with, the, with the knowledge and skills uh, uh, to face these challenges. So as uh, people are shifted to remote uh, work and remote learning, digital access uh, for all is necessary if we want to ensure uh, that no one and no place uh, left behind. So to address uh, this uh, growing digital uh, divide between genders and economic uh, groups uh, in both urban and rural areas, uh, we call also our uh, national governments to accelerate development of information and communication technologies infrastructure. So uh, uh, let me also conclude here by uh, saying that local and regional governments have been conducting uh, bottom-up reporting on the SDGs attainment uh, through um, voluntary subnational review or VSR and a voluntary local review or VLRs. Uh, in Asia Pacific, there have been uh, two uh, VSRs. Uh, in this uh, Indonesia and Nepal uh, submitted since 2020. And uh, three PSRs are being developed for Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and the Philippines. There also have been uh, around 22 PLRs submitted since 2017, and four PLRs in the developments. This include Dulical, Jakarta, Melbourne, and Singra. So uh, we are also happy that uh, PSR uh, of Indonesia and PLR Surabaya have been included in the PNR of Indonesian government. So. This uh, VSR and VLR are used as instrument uh, for us to increase ownership and commitment to the global 2030 agenda and strengthening multi-level and multi-stakeholders dialogue. So we would like to call, and again, we call on national governments to uh, explore mechanism that uh, is, can institutionalize uh, synergies uh, between VNR, VSR, and VLR as well as uh, find synergies uh, to this uh, SDG localization and the new urban agenda. So there is much we can do and much more we can do together. So as uh, APRG members, uh, we remain committed uh, to national and regional efforts and recovering from the pandemic and attaining the 2030 agenda. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Terima kasih, Kapunga. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for all the contributions. Um, as I announced earlier, the remaining um, statements will be um, will be made uh, if um, in, at the the third item uh, um, of the program. And now let us commence the discussions on review on regional progress on SDGs. The documents pertinent to this session are. Asia and the Pacific SDG Progress Report 2022, widening disparities amidst COVID-19, ASCAP slash RFSD slash 2022 slash 3, and progress towards the attainment of sustainable development goals 4, 5, 14, 15, and 17 at the regional level, ASCAP slash RFSD slash 2022 INF slash 1. This session is structured as follows. We will start with a presentation from the Secretariat on progress on implementation of the SDGs in Asia and the Pacific. And afterwards, I will open the floor for the delivery of country and stakeholder statements. It is my pleasure now to invite Mr. Kev Zaidi, Deputy Executive Secretary of ESCAP, to deliver the presentation by the Secretariat. Thank you very much, uh, Excellency. Excellencies, uh, distinguished participants, uh, dear colleagues, uh, it's a great pleasure to share with you ESCAP's assessment of Asia-Pacific's progress in the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, including in the context of COVID-19. ESCAP's annual Asia-Pacific SDG Progress Report is now in its sixth year of publication and is really central to our understanding as it provides a coherent picture of progress in our region and in its sub-regions. 
The report is supported by the SDG Gateway, a comprehensive platform for SDG progress assessment based on data provided by countries and, assessed from the and accessed from the global SDG indicator database maintained by DESA. This year's report benefits from the expertise and inputs from a much wider group, including 10 regional partners as shown on your screens, that has established and enabled us to also look beyond the averages and identify disparities amongst the population groups within our region. Each year we present to you a more detailed and probably a more accurate picture of progress, thanks in part to improvements in data. For the first time since we started this process, this year more than half of the 231 SDG indicators have sufficient, sufficient data. Compared with 2017, data availability in Asia and the Pacific has actually doubled. The success in improving SDG data and filling what were at one stage gaping holes only two years ago shows that the commitment and investment of countries in their data systems is beginning to pay off. We have a much clearer picture of progress. With analysis from the contributing UN entities, we also have a much better idea of what some of the aggregate numbers don't show, especially for groups that are often left behind. So what does this year's progress assessment tell us? It shows, quite simply, that time is running out. Except for some strong progress under Goal 7, Affordable and Clean Energy, and Goal 9 on Industry, Infrastructure and Innovation, the pace has been too slow to reach the goals by 2030. The data also shows that Asia-Pacific is moving in the wrong direction. When it comes to climate action, SDG 13, and responsible consumption and production, SDG 12. This slow action on reducing carbon emissions is resulting in runaway climate change and rising vulnerabilities in our region. The improvements in data have also revealed to us that some of the progress was not quite as good as we once thought. For example, when we started, the data showed that SDG 4 on education was on track. But now, with more data points covering a broader range of the targets, we see that progress on education is also too slow, something that, of course, will benefit from the outcomes of the upcoming Education Summit. The progress assessment also shows us where the region could be heading by 2030. The green shows us, for example, that with our current trajectories, less than 10% of the measurable targets will be achieved by 2030. The predominance of the yellow and red confirms that we are still far off track, for example, from the burning of fossil fuels to ensuring inclusive growth and decent employment. And the gray areas, like goal five on gender and quality, like goal 14 on life below water, and Goal 16 on peace, justice, and strong institutions show targets that cannot be tracked yet because of the lack of data or as yet unmeasurable targets. Therefore, while there is much less of the gray areas this year, our work on SDG data and statistics at the national, regional, and global levels will still need to continue to fill the remaining gaps. We also understand better some of the sub-regional differences. For example, East and Northeast Asia is on track to achieve goal one by 2030. But when it comes to sustainable consumption and production, goal 12, or the climate actions, goal 13, the progress is in the wrong direction across all of the subregions in Asia and the Pacific. In addition to these subregional differences, the report also shows that some of the other differences. As we drill down, certain groups are progressing at much slower pace than others. Analysis supported by the 10 contrib contributing UN partners helped us look at how six vulnerable groups are lagging behind and by how far. Disruptions by the pandemic caused significant setbacks in achieving gender equality, for example. The enormous strain by COVID-19 on the health systems caused disruptions to access of women to maternal health services, 
data also reveals the alarming trend of increasing violence against women and girls during the pandemic. This makes the implementation of the Asia-Pacific Declaration on Advancing Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment at the Beijing Plus 25 Review ever more important. The adverse impacts were also found among the older persons. In 20 countries, less than half of the older populations receive some form of pension. This means that millions of older persons are left to fend for themselves in times of crisis, with the COVID-19 pandemic being a case in point. This is, of course, highly significant for Asia Pacific, where population aging is a reality. Proactive and more inclusive aging policies are needed to avoid large segments of the population falling back into poverty. This is something that will be a central part of the review of the implementation of the Madrid International Plan of Action on Aging this very year. Disruptions by the pandemic also had a significant impact on children. About 8 million missed out on routine immunizations in 2020 alone. Over 30 million were affected by wasting caused by poor nutrition. Over 10% of the lower secondary level students are out of school, with girls from poorest households and rural areas at highest risk of dropping out. These staggering numbers underline the urgency to act. We know that once a child is pulled out of school or is malnourished, the repercussions will be felt for years and likely to perpetuate poverty from one generation to the next. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed chair, the pandemic has reinforced many of the patterns that existed before. It has accentuated deep inequalities, not only in the impact of the pandemic, but also very much evident in the recovery, the so-called K-shaped recovery. People in vulnerable situations were the most affected by COVID and are now recovering at a much slower pace than others. And the countries in special situations, including the small island developing states, are facing a more difficult economic rebound. The pandemic has also further slowed progress towards the SDGs. What we are seeing from data is a slowdown of progress that would mean not achieving the SDGs for another 30 or 40 years. But we also know that acceleration, but we also know what acceleration uh, would take and have learned important lessons from the previous financial crisis, including here in Asia. Investments in healthcare, in quality education, and in social protect protection are the fundamental elements of a better tomorrow. They cannot be given up as countries make the fiscal space needed for economic recovery alone or debt sustainability. We look to the deliberations of governments, businesses, civil society organizations, and experts who are with us this week at the 9th Asia-Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development to identify solutions for an inclusive, resilient, and sustainable recovery, with the SDGs reinstated as the paramount roadmap for the region's development. Allow me, esteemed chair, to conclude my presentation here. For more details of what I've just presented, the work of my colleagues, I invite you to visit our SDG gateway. Thank you, chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Zaidi. That was very comprehensive uh, uh, and um, very worrying, too. Um, and, but it's good to know where we are. And if we put our act together, we can do this. We can still do this. So with that spirit, if we continue with this um, gathering, I'm sure we will be able to set um, more ambitious targets, and, and we, can, we can do this. Uh, I am very confident of that. Uh, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, I understand we will have a special intervention from Mr. Matthias uh, Coleman, Secretary General of the OECD. I invite the conference uh, officer to play the video remarks received from the OECD. Uh, Deputy Executive Secretary, Mr. Kavi Zahidi, distinguished guests,
thank you for inviting me to address the ninth Asia-Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development. The OECD is committed to deepening our engagement with the broader Asia-Pacific region. The unequal recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed serious gaps between and within populations, accelerating the divergence between rich and developing countries. Effective and well-coordinated development cooperation will be key to help ensure that less affluent countries achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. First, we must leverage the active role of Asia-Pacific countries. Many Asia-Pacific countries have become official providers of development cooperation and are advancing new innovative approaches. The OECD is proud to support Indonesia as a knowledge partner during its G20 presidency, including on sustainable recovery and the G20 blended finance principles. Asia-Pacific countries are also actively sharing knowledge to co-create development solutions, especially through triangular cooperation. Second, we need to increase public and private investments for the Sustainable Development Goals, and especially for supporting the transition to greener and sustainable development pathways. To achieve this, we need to better align global finance with sustainable development. Drawing on the data from the total official support for sustainable development framework, there are 43 recipient countries in the Asia-Pacific region that received $98.6 billion US in support in 2020. Looking particularly at SDGs 4, 5, 14, 15 and 17 reviewed in this forum, we see that some $20.6 billion US was made available in support of these five objectives. Among these, SDG 5 on gender equality was most supported with $15.8 billion US. This is encouraging, but more will need to be done on gender equality and on advancing women's economic empowerment. Urgent action is also needed to deliver on SDG 4 on quality education by addressing the educational crisis and inequalities exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Third, governments have to strike a balance between short-term recovery measures and longer-term sustainability objectives. The OECD is supporting several countries in linking their national recovery and resilience plans to the principles of the 2030 Agenda and could offer policy implementation support and capacity building tailored to specific country contexts. We stand ready to work with the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific and Asia-Pacific countries in taking this next step towards building a strong, resilient and sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you, uh, distinguished delegates. I'm pleased to invite the distinguished delegates to intervene on agenda item two, building back better from COVID-19, while advancing the full implementation of the 2030 agenda in Asia and the Pacific. I will open the floor to statements from delegates in the speaking order as received from the Secretariat from both participants present in the room and connected through kudos. I kindly remind delegates to limit their statements to no longer than three minutes um, to allow all delegates the opportunity to speak. We do not wish to um, carry forward um, the statements to another uh, item. Um, so I first uh, give the floor to the distinguished delegate from China, uh, followed by the distinguished delegate, um, the resident coordinator of Kyrgyzstan. Um, China, have the floor.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to attend the ninth uh, forum on sustainable development. I hope this forum will build consensus on development, forge partnership, enhance capability, and boost the confidence in it. China always takes development as the top uh, government governance agenda, actively implement 2030 agenda. With its people-centered approach, China advocates a new development philosophy to promote high-quality development. China has achieved historical miracle uh, uh, in the elimination of uh, absolute poverty. China has built the largest social security network and compulsory education system in the world. The status of women have been continuously improved. China adopts the concept of harmonious coexistence between man and nature by promoting green development, preserving natural environment, and advancing ecological civilization. China always stands in solidarity with other developing countries. Yichinfasanilai,中国首先开展全球紧急人道主义援助,先后向一百二十多个国家和国际组织,提供了超过二十一G一苗,在中国以外全球一苗使用总量的三分之一,是对外援助一苗最多的国家为全球,实现免疫
uh, Statistics Committee to compile global and national SDG indicators. So first, with the support of the UN Statistics Division and the UK government, we've uh, started work on a national SDG reporting platform. And this serves as a key resource for information on SDG statistics. Second, of course, is uh, our colleagues at UNSCAP supporting the committee, not just in Kyrgyzstan, but in the sub-region, to establish an SDG tracking system that allows each country to measure progress towards the SDGs. Third is that uh, Kegi's population and housing status census started uh, three days ago and has been led by the Statistics Com Committee with significant support, training, and other resources from the UN using mobile applications for data collection. And UN Women, together with uh, Paris 21, has conducted a comprehensive gender assessment of the national statistics system and the capacity of the system to deliver on uh, SDG tracking and reporting. And the conclusions and recommendations of this assessment will be used in the development of the national strategy for the development of statistics for the next four years, as well as the draft national intersectoral plan for the development of gender statistics. UNICEF has begun a multi-indicator cluster survey that provides reliable backdrop for 33 SDG indicators. And it's also doing some interesting work on institutionalizing a national measure of multidimensional poverty and introducing a multi-dimensional poverty index. So in conclusion, excellencies, I would like um, you're, you're, you're muted, I think. Uh, um. I'm sorry. Yes, but just to say that uh, the Kegiz, UN system in the Kegiz Republic is supporting the government in uh, trying to reverse the trends that we are eloquently testified to by the Deputy Executive Secretary. And we hope that uh, when the government makes their own intervention, they can refer to the specific activities that they are doing through the National Development Plan to realize the SDGs in the Kegiz Republic. Thank you, Chairperson and Excellencies. Thank, thank you, Excellency. And now I invite the... Um for the statement from International Migrant Alliance. Um, that would be the last statement uh, for this session for today. Thank you, Chair. My name is Annie Lestari. I'm an Indonesian migrant domestic worker in Hong Kong. Today, I speak on behalf of the Asia Pacific Regional CSO Engagement Mechanism. COVID-19 has exposed structural fault lines manifested by the increasing poverty and hunger, crippled health, education, and social protection system widening inequalities within and among countries, diverting focus from the overdue climate action and shrinking democratic spaces around the world. Our region is only expected to achieve Agenda 2030 by 2065. Too little, too late. While government grapple with recovery, migrants are among those hit the hardest and remain farthest from recovery. Many have lost jobs and have been repatriated. Those remaining overseas are overworked, harassed for their debts, stigmatized as virus spreader, and left behind by inequitable response measures. As the pandemic continues, migrants become more insecure, more vulnerable, and more invisible. Inequalities across the world are not only persistent, but shameful. New figures and analysis released by the World Inequality Lab reveals the top 1% have captured 19 times more of global wealth growth than the whole of the bottom 50% of humanity. Also in 2021, while the richest 20% are expected to have recovered 
close to half of their losses. The World Bank expects that the poorest 20% will, on average, lose a further 5% of their income. Women have suffered the harshest economic impact of the pandemic and collectively lost $800 billion in earnings in 2020. While employment for men is recovering more quickly, 13 million fewer women were in, employ in employment in 2021 compared to 2019. Women informal workers have been among the most affected economically, facing a triple crisis of increased unpaid care work and insecure and precarious pet work pushing many further into poverty. Negative trends between environment and development within and among countries abound. We note that countries that perform well on the SDGs have the highest ecological footprint and highest international spillover. This means, one, that SDG performance still hinges on countries displacing their negative environmental footprint to other countries through trade. Number two, that the development patterns promoted by Agenda 2030 still remain unjust and unsustainable. To reiterate what was stated during the opening forum, no woman, man, or country is an island. Without working to minimize social and environmental trade off between and within countries, achieving Agenda 2030 will remain a pipe dream. We need to recognize that the drivers of migration, which is poverty, unemployment, landlessness, climate injustice, conflict, are caused and have been made worse by neoliberal policies imposed on economies and people for a very long time. We call on our leaders to veer away from remittance dependency economy to people-centered sustainable economic pathway based on human rights and justice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, excellencies, distinguished delegates, we have now reached the end of the time allotted for this session. Um, we're getting ready for the next session. Um, um, we have a few minutes between the closing of this session and the next session. Um, is Japan ready? Who's next on the list? We could allow Japan to continue. Um, you could also allow Thailand if they're ready for this. Uh, Thailand, are you ready for your statement? No? Okay. Okay, then we'll stop. Okay. Well, we've got a few more speakers lined up. So, And I sincerely apologize uh, um, to delegations though, who have not yet been given the floor. We will pursue the remaining items under Agenda 2 again on Wednesday, 30th March. Um, so we'll invite them to deliver their statements during that session. Allow me to close this session and thank you all for your contributions and for an excellent segment, uh, except that we couldn't keep the time as much as we wanted. Uh, Please note that for agenda item three, His Excellency Ali Sabri, uh, Minister of Justice of Sri Lanka, as Vice Chair of the Forum, will guide the deliberations. May I therefore invite His Excellency, Excellency Minister Sabri to take the floor.
Your Excellencies, distinguished delegates, I would like to express my sincere appreciation for your trust bestowed on me in to serve one of the co-chair, vice chairs of this meeting. During this session, we will proceed with the agenda item three, namely system-wide results of the United Nations Development System at the regional level in Asia and Pacific in support of the implementation of 2030 agenda. We will go back to the items in the agenda two later on Wednesday as indicated on the program. The document pertinent to this session is United in Action, system-wide results of the United Nations Development System at the regional level in Asia and the Pacific in 2021. At the outset, we will hear the introductory remarks by Ms. Amina Mohammed, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations and the Chair of the Regional Collaborative Platform for Asia and the Pacific, followed by a presentation of the document for this agenda item by co-vice chairs of the Regional Collaborative Platform for Asia and Pacific. I'm sure it's going to be a very interesting presentation and a session. It is my pleasure, therefore, now to invite Ms. Amina Mohammed, Deputy Secretary General of the United, Station, United Nations, to take the floor. Madam, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Your Excellency, Ali Sabri, Minister of Justice, Sri Lanka, Your Excellency, Ms. Ayusha, Minister of Social Protection and Labor from Mongolia, and Your Excellency Mohammed Aslam, the Minister of National Planning, Housing and Infrastructure. Mr. Surya Chindawonse, Vice President of ECOSOC, and my colleague, Ms. Armida Alisha Jamana, the Executive Secretary of ESCAP. Excellencies, distinguished participants, it's a great pleasure to be with you again today to discuss how the regional United Nations Development System has collectively supported member states' priorities for implementing the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development over the past year. Our societies and economies were slowly recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic. Now the crisis in Ukraine is causing food, energy, and fertilizer prices to rocket. Our agencies are warning on hunger on an unprecedented scale, and this can have devastating impact on the region with many countries heavily reliant on wheat imports from Russia and Ukraine. Transformative changes are urgently needed to get back on track to achieve the SDGs. The United Nations Development System is fully behind governments and national stakeholders to enable such change, with the reform of the UN Development System that was initiated in 2018 providing renewed impetus, improved agility, and a greater focus on our collective action. At the country level, the resident coordinators and the new generation of UN country teams are delivering improved leadership, strategic programming support, and policy advice in response to countries' priorities and needs. With stronger and more integrated regional and global support, the UN is moving as one and pulling together system-wide assets to respond to the pandemic and to accelerate the SDG progress. At the regional level, the Regional Collaborative Platform has been instrumental in reinforcing a culture of collaboration across the UN development system. Issue-based coalitions are providing thought leadership, policy coherence, and cross-UN support to UN country teams. Our Executive Secretary of ESCAP and the Regional Director of UNDP will outline the results achieved last year in greater detail. There's much that we can be proud of. Through the regional collaborative platforms, the UN Development System supported countries in designing comprehensive social protection programs. It enabled country teams and governments to integrate gender equality and the protection of human rights in the finalization of cooperation frameworks. And we also supported countries' efforts to reach a higher level of climate ambition in their nationally determined contributions. In a region where half the population has no social protection system to fall back on, the important setbacks, with important setbacks on gender equality and where the existence of entire nations is threatened by sea level rise, these are significant achievements. 
But there is also much more to be done if we are to reverse the trend in the region and get back on track to achieve the SDGs by 2030. This year again, our resident coordinators and UN country teams will be tested to deliver scale, ambition, expertise and financing solutions. Their teams will need to deliver seamlessly to support countries as they embark on a transition in energy and food systems and digital connectivity and support the SDG promise to leave no one behind. They will need to do so as the socioeconomic fallout of the Ukraine-Russia conflict bring a further strain on a country's recovery prospects. In 2021, for the first time, more than half of the 231 SDG indicators in the region have sufficient data to measure progress. It shows that the investments and efforts of countries supported by the SDG Data and Statistics Working Group of the Regional Collaborative Platform have started to bear fruit. We are opening access to such expertise and knowledge assets through the Asia-Pacific Knowledge Management Hub with over 1,500 interactions a month. We hope this gives member states additional supportive evidence to orient their priorities for the 2030 agenda. Excellencies, the regional collaborative platform started when the COVID-19 pandemic brought our world to a standstill. But the pandemic also offered added impetus to unite our forces and assist you where you needed us the most. This meeting is an important exercise of accountability and transparency. It is an opportunity for our regional assets to hear from you how they can best serve your needs and priorities to deliver on the Sustainable Development Goals. Together with my co-vice chairs of the Regional Collaborative Platform, we are ready to support you in your efforts to achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. I very much look forward to hearing your feedback and the opportunity to discuss these issues with you today. Thank you. Many thanks, Deputy Secretary General. I'm pleased now to invite the two co-vice chairs of the Regional Collaborative Platform for Asia and the Pacific, Ms. Amida Salsia Alice Jabana, Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Executive Secretary of ESCAP, and Ms. Kani Vignaraja, Assistant Secretary General, Assistant Administrator and Director of the Regional Bureau for Asia and the Pacific United Nations Development Program to present the report on system-wide results on the United Nations in Asia Pacific for 2021. Madam Executive Secretary, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, as the Deputy Secretary General highlighted, the reform of the UN development system is already evident in our work and has better positioned us to support uh, countries and people of the region to tackle their challenges as well as to recover better together from the pandemic. Uh, may I take this opportunity to illustrate this with a few concrete examples from the joint report on system-wide results before you. First, we are supporting countries to tackle cross-border and common challenges with cross-agency policy support and coordinated advocacy from our regional UN hub. On climate action, for example, the collective assessment of our issue-based coalition on climate change mitigation showed a major shortfall in the NDCs from this region with staggering increase of 35% in greenhouse gas emission expected by 2030 compared to 2010. As a result, we work with regional partners and the UNRCs to support countries with detailed analysis and technical support in the lead up to and during COP26. And we are now channeling this collective expertise to support countries in the region to raise the level of emissions in their uh, NDCs or national, nationally determined contribution in line with the Glasgow Climate Pact, including, for example, in countries, uh, wide-ranging countries from Bangladesh, Indonesia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Mongolia. Second, we are mobilizing expertise from across the UN to support countries in multilateral intergovernmental dialogues that are helping accelerate actions on critical global and regional agenda. 
One good example uh, is on the CRVS or on the civil registration and vital statistics, which is supported by 13 regional United Nations entities and development partners, including international financial institutions or the IFIs. We came together to support improvements in civil registration and vital statistics. The collective work has contributed to the region's significant progress to re register all deaths and births, something that has become even more vital and important with the COVID-19 pandemic. Similarly, our collective analysis has put into spotlight the impacts of the pandemic on education and enabled us to step up our work in ensuring quality education and keeping children in school. We are collectively working towards the Asia-Pacific Regional Education Ministers Conference, supported by the RCP, or Regional Collaborative uh, Platform and Networking Group on Education. And our annual commemoration of the International Day of Clean Air for Blue Skies has helped to accelerate cooperation on uh, tackling or combating air pollution. The increased regional cooperation has enabled us to promote and support the use of the latest satellite technology for effective monitoring and actions on air pollution and work for its solution. Third, we remain a steadfast partner to assist and work with sub-regional organizations in accelerating the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. Our work with ASEAN has been scaled up on many fronts guided by the UN ASEAN Plan of Action. In diverse areas, including strengthening of adaptation to drought, mm -hmm. women, peace and security, and access rights in environmental decision making, the UN family has provided support from the regional level. The issue-based coalition is now focused on delivering on the ASEAN-UN Joint Strategic Plan of Action for disaster management for 2022-2026, a critical framework for holistic disaster risk reduction in ASEAN countries. Let me finish by reiterating again that the regional UN is acting as one across the sustainable development panorama from phasing out of coal to building resilience to disaster and pandemics and supporting women's economic empowerment. We are also supporting and helping to bring vital global agendas, including financing, education, and food system to the regional and national levels, providing unified policy advice and collective support to our member states and the UN country teams, something that my co-vice chair, uh, Kani, will speak to in more detail. Allow me now to hand over to my, uh, my co-vice chair, Kani Wignaraja. Thank you, Ibu Armida. Your Excellency, Ali Sabri, uh, Deputy Secretary General, um, All Excellencies. Maybe let me um, further unpack uh, what uh, both uh, our Deputy Secretary General and my co-vice chair has um, shared with you in terms of what all of this, at the end of the day, what it means uh, to countries uh, pushing, struggling, uh, but also doing uh, everything they can to come out of the pandemic, sometimes onto pathways that are different to the ones that they were following uh, before uh, COVID. Now, we've seen signs of recovery from the worst of the pandemic. At the same time, we are seeing the reality of the widening inequalities, uh, often injustices, that it has left behind in its wake. And so for us as, as UN teams, at regional level, at country levels, we want to go beyond the metrics and really unpack uh, what these numbers hide uh, of those who have been most affected and left behind, um, not only because of the pandemic, but just like we discussed this morning, the multiple pandemics, if you wish, um, that has compounded uh, poverty, uh, hunger, um, discriminations, uh, climate inaction, uh, and other uh, and conflicts that we have seen. We discussed this morning two countries in our region 
that have lost 20 years of development progress uh, due to conflict. So for us, if you add uh, the national lockdowns, the break in supply chains, um, we are really seeing partial or skewed recoveries, as we said. And this is something in trying to regain our balance on the social and economic fronts. It requires multiple disciplines to come together. And this is the strength of our UN system, where we are able to bring uh, those different, the different expertise, the different assets to the table, and to provide to you a more whole, a more integrated response to issues that are not a single sector. Um, and that's where I think the strength of also what we can do in regional level to support our country teams comes to the fore. If I take an illustration of our issue-based coalition that works on human rights, on gender equality and women's empowerment, the work that they're doing very, very closely with our country teams in Afghanistan, in Cambodia, Malaysia, and Nepal, to address very specific vulnerabilities of those who have been pushed even further behind to where they were. This work, you can see, is now translated into a higher level of ambition in our UN Sustainable Development Corporation frameworks. And we hear every day from our DSG that we've got to keep pushing our expectations of ourselves if we are to be of greater relevance and value to you at the country level. It translates immediately then into supporting governments make some very hard policy and investment choices. And when we hear that there is not enough money to go around, we often will say, actually there is. It's just where the choices that political leadership makes in where those investments come through. And this is where our issue-based coalition uh, has done a lot of work to bring that to the fore in these countries. And I hope that this is something we can do for many more countries in the region. The second area I want to pick up from what Ibu Armida mentioned is that our UN country teams now, I feel are in increasingly better position to support and analyze national SDG progress not at the level of general averages, but really unpacking what this is, often at the most subnational of levels, but even there, looking at it at household level, uh, different groups impacted very differently, and by providing them with greater capacities to do so, they in turn are supporting national data and statistical systems actually pick this up in ways that are more differentiated than before. The third and, and last area I wanted to pick up was the well-being of young people in our countries. And we've really put this at the heart of a lot of work we are doing together. And again, it means bringing different sectors, different ministries, different expertise to the table. And where better than with a UN system that can do that across the agencies, funds, and programs that we can uh, work together with at global, regional, and country levels. So if I take one example, recently, the national roadmaps being introduced by UN country teams in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, in Indonesia, and I see our RC Valerie over there uh, in Pakistan and Papua New Guinea, on the issue, for example, of child wasting. And that's just one example. Again, that's not something you can come at through one lens. You've got to bring a whole number of experts and skill sets together to look at this. The same, for example, on the return. We were talking about the partial recoveries that our countries are seeing. But in many of our Pacific islands, this has really hurt the ability for these countries to recover. And so in Fiji and in other SIDS, really looking at the design of measures that allow schools to reopen, uh, factories to reopen, uh, and bringing those as tools uh, and applications, right time, right place uh, for, for our country teams to support you. 
Let me end with a note that says, certainly after so many years working in the UN system, in this region, I have never seen this level of teamwork and collaboration. And it is truly with pride that we present our results report to you, because behind the results on the words, you have teams working together that come at it with a level of spirit of collaboration that really is something we need, and we hope then to impart that to impact your recovery in each of your countries, because without you, all of this means very little. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Madam Executive Secretary and uh, Mrs. Vigneraja. Before I open the floor to the statement from the member states and other stakeholders, it is my pleasure to invite His Excellency, Mr. Surya Chingdawanse, Vice President of ECOSOC, to provide some reflection on the work of the United Nations at the regional level. Ambassador Surya, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And your Excellency, Mr. Chair, the Deputy Secretary General, uh, the two co-vice chairs for, for their presentations. I'd like to, um, as, as uh, instructed by the chair, to give some reflections. And once we talk about reflections, I, start, I better start stop looking at my notes. Because reflections require some sort of um, delving inside. And, and let me just share with you, I guess that will be quite helpful here, I hope. Uh, some of the lessons learned and observations that um, I, I, I managed to receive as the, the chair of what we call the coordination segment of the ECOSOC uh, that took place in February in New York. And as we were trying to see what were some of the lessons learned as we tried to take forward the sustainable development agenda amidst all the challenges that humanity is facing. There are a couple things I think I'd like to share. Number one, it was almost uh, a consensus view uh, from both member states and the various subsidiary bodies that the development work, despite the challenges, uh, the coordination effort, the effort to try to generate synergies has actually taken on a higher level. And, and this is in part because of the very strong effort undertaken at the regional level uh, whether, you know, um, for the various subsidiary bodies, um, uh, whether you know, the regional commissions, UNDP, and so many other agencies. So, so the sense of it I'd like to share with you, and this is something that we should, um, you know, commend, is that the development work, despite the challenges, continues. And this is needed much more than ever because the challenges that the humanity is facing with regard to the SDGs, with regard to trying to achieve the timelines, is increasing. All right, so that's the first observation I'd like to share with you. Secondly, there's the sense that there are special considerations that need to be undertaken. And, and those special considerations are some of the things that have already been reflected in the, the, the co-vice chair's report. For example, the need to really focus on the gender issue, the need to give special attention to women, girls, and children, because this is uh, an area where if we manage to get things done right, it's an important multiplier effect to the development agenda. I'm not even going to talk about the, the disproportionate uh, impact that women and girls receive because of the, the impact that, they, that affect them because of the pandemic and, and the economic uh, consequences. Those we know. But despite that, how can we resolve that and, and, and close the gender gaps and make sure that they contribute even more effectively, give them the tools necessary, uh, the education, the opportunities, the access to um, finance and other things, so that they become an important force multiplier in the development process. 
uh, that was one of the special factors, I think, that, that came across the coronation segment. The other one is that the attention that we need to pay to LDCs, LDCs, and SIDS, SIDS, uh, because they're also very vulnerable, and, and, and the pandemic has not made things easier. The recovery has not made things easier. The divergencies and gaps in finance, in access to technologies, has not made things easier. And not to mention, of course, the continuing impacts of environmental degradation and climate change challenges. So, so, so these are some of the special issues, I think, that, um, that came, came across in some discussions I'd like to share with you. The third is how do we, despite all these challenges, how do we leverage on the combined assets, whether at the global level or at the regional level, uh, in order to, to surmount the development uh, challenges and take forward the SDGs. Uh, again, the word I used this morning, it's not my words, it's the words of the Secretary General to turbocharge the SDGs uh, at a time of, of, of great challenges. How do we, how do we take that forward? And, and of course, one of the things that was discussed uh, was uh, how do we make use of greater synergies and partnerships between uh, the various uh, subsidiary bodies um, and between the global level and the regional level. Uh, for example, uh, how do we make use of the partnerships between ITU and UN Women and UNICEF, for example, to use technology and, and, and advance the education at a time, long distance learning, um, you know, through the, the internet, at a time when, when there, are, there are challenges regarding uh, safe distancing, for example. These are just some of the ideas. There were so many others, all right? So, so the, the necessity, necessity of getting those partnerships synergized uh, has been highlighted even more than before. And this alludes to another one of the uh, key leveraging that I'd like to share, and I hinted at it, is that how do we make better use of digital technology and other uh, fourth industrial revolution technologies in order to, I wouldn't say leapfrog the development process, that cannot really happen, but how can we provide better access to those tools so that we can, uh, you know, surmount at least some of the development challenges and, and ensure that the right solutions get to the right people with greater efficiency. So that was, um, the, the leveraging on technology was, was an important um, uh, issue uh, that was discussed, and I'd like to share that with you. And, and, and so, um, and lastly is, uh, and, I cannot under, and I cannot emphasize this enough, is that the, the necessity of having a very strong global regional interface uh, between the great work that the uh, various subsidiary bodies are doing here in the region, the regional teams, the country teams, and what is being undertaken at the headquarters wherever they may be, you know, whether it's in New York, Geneva, or other places. And of course, uh, much credit has to go to the DSG and her work as you know, the, the, the chief coordinator of the SDGs and the UN system. Um, and and, and this, um, I, I, uh, this is something that we appreciate and, and the, you know, the, just to share with you, the Thai Prime Minister appreciated this already in the discussions we had this morning. So, so this, is, this is the type of leveraging that we need to do you know, at a time of great challenges. Let me just end, if I may, uh, Mr. Chair, just in a couple more minutes to look at the future and to see how this is all relate to the agenda of the UN, and especially under the Our Common Agenda that the Secretary General is pushing in cooperation and in partnership with member states. And the ECOSOC, uh, which I'm the vice chair of Paris President, has been supporting this work. A couple things that we need to bear in mind. Number one thing is one of the ideas that's emerging under the Our Common Agenda is how do we make the United Nations system as a whole, how do you say, it, uh, to be more uh, digitally savvy, more technology oriented, and to be the, one of the uh, premier collectors and analyzers of information and database. The type of UN that, in addition to the work that it's doing right now, to be able to give that critical analysis to various challenges that we may be facing. And I think this, this idea of, a, of a, 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 United, a networked United Nations that can provide you know, um, important, timely, and, and analyzed data uh, so that member states and the various subsidiary bodies can, can make the right decisions. Now, this is something that's being discussed, and this is something I think we, we would need to think about as we take forward the development agenda at the regional level and even at the global level. 
Taking it one step further, uh, to share with you, there is a, a, a growing discussion on one, another important uh, agenda uh, that is in the, our common agenda, that is the idea of the, what we call the, the futures package. Now, what is all that? that? That includes, like, for instance, how do we convene a summit of the future, future to think of the challenges that we may be facing in the future? How do we uh, develop um, foresight to help predict what are the challenges that humankind will face, humanity will face uh, in the future? And all that, of course, leads to how do we make the United Nations to make uh, the various subsidiary bodies better equipped to think of the future and plan for the future. And that is definitely something that we need to take into account as we look at the sustainable development agenda. All right, and, and I guess uh, one, one final point, one final point is um, as we look at the development agenda process, one I, I would uh, highly recommend um, uh, a, 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 a reading of the very important work that UNDP has just come out, which is the New Dimensions on Human Security. Because, uh, at least in my view, uh, as we take forward the sustainable development agenda, we, as we try to reach the 2030 goals, um, the various aspects of human security will become even more important, um, especially uh, as they relate to what I call planet issues. Uh, Things like um, how do we ensure there is um, sufficient water? How do we ensure that we deal with climate change? How do we ensure that we have an environment that can help sustain uh, human security in the long run? All right. So these are just some reflections, if I may, Mr. Chair, to share with you. Um, and, and hopefully that will generate some discussions. And, and you are the member states. You are the, the main uh, chefs, so to speak, in the sustainable event agenda menu uh, for the region, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Ambassador Surya, for those valuable reflections and comments. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, I'm pleased to invite the distinguished delegates to intervene on agenda item three, system-wide results of the United Nations Development System at the regional level in Asia and the Pacific in support of the implementation of 2030 Agenda. And now I'll open the floor to statements from delegates in the speaking order as I received from the Secretariat from both participants present in the room and connected through KUDO. I kindly remind the delegates, please limit your statements to no longer than three minutes length to allow all delegates the opportunity to speak. I first uh, recognize the distinguished delegate from the Mongolia. The, de uh, it, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Distinguished delegates, uh, Mongolia has been making persistent efforts to implement the SDGs ever since its ad adoption. Uh, we have developed new indicators which, is custom, which uh, have been customized in line with the local circumstances using methodology of UN Statistics Division in order to evaluate and access um, the uh, SDG implementation at national level. The government of Mongolia has adopted a um, policy document, Vision 2050, uh, long-term development policy to ensure the implementation of SDGs at national level. The government of Mongolia has been committed to implement UN initiatives, including Madrid International Plan of Action on Aging, Incheon Strategy to make the right real for persons with disabilities in Asia and the Pacific, and so forth through national policies and strategies. The, uh, we have a very close and fruitful cooperation with uh, whole UN uh, system organizations. I'd like here to thank whole UN family for close cooperation and always being so supportive. Uh, especially, of course, um, would I would like to emphasize the close cooperation with UN ESCAP in the area of population and social protection. The year 2022 uh, is the due year for not only the government of Mongolia, but also the entire region to submit reporting on the implementation of several international strategies and plans. In its uh, regard, we are also closely cooperating to submit respective reports within the due term. 
Uh, I am deeply honored to inform that the government of Mongolia has been submitting reports on the implementation of international plans and strategies with due term to support the guidance from UNSCAP uh, for the recent works, um, such as we have submitted report on implementation of Madrid uh, International Action Plan um, in, 20, in December 2021. Um, currently, we are working to prepare, submit implementation on Incheon strategy, make the right real, um, in April 2022. In order to ensure the implementation of UN principles, leaving no one behind, together we have organized training for policymakers, statisticians, regarding the uh, use of cutting-edge tools to, to, de to determine populations left furthest behind in achievement of SDGs. Mongolia has supported ESCAP initiative action plan to strengthen regional cooperation on social protection in the region. <clears throat> uh, we have been selected as one uh, of the pilot countries to implement in the action plan in order to advance inclusive social protection, not only in Mongolia, but also in Asia Pacific. And we are working to conduct national stock taking survey on social protection schemes and identify pathways to further strengthen social protection as national as also the regional levels. Um, thank you so much. And I, I'd like to express here the Mongolia's commitment to further expand our cooperation. Thank you so much. Thank you, distinguished delegate from Mongolia. Um, may I now invite the distinguished delegate uh, from Maldives uh, to make your intervention. Good afternoon, excellencies, uh, colleagues, and distinguished delegates. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share some experiences from the Maldives. Social protection has been an important focus of our collaboration with ESCAP. The Maldives served as co-chair to the group of experts that drafted the action plan to strengthen regional cooperation on social protection in Asia and the Pacific, which was adopted by US ESCAP member states in October 2020. I'm very pleased to report that the Maldives was identified as a pilot country for implementing the action plan. For this purpose, the government of Maldives is working with ESCAP through the Ministry of Gender, Family and Social Services, the Maldives National Social, Social Protection Agency, and the Maldives National University to develop a country report on social protection and to hold a national consultation on its findings with a wider group of stakeholders in order to make the study as inclusive as possible. The purpose of the study is to take stock of good practices on social protection in the Maldives and to discuss our readiness to further implement the action plan. ESCAP has also been working very closely and providing support in the area of population aging in the Maldives by working closely with the Office of the UN Resident Coordinator and providing support to the Government of Maldives in assessing progress in the implementation of the Madrid International Plan of Action in, on Aging, which is feeding into the fourth review and appraisal of uh, MIPA. ESCAP and the RC office were instrumental in providing support to the government of Maldives to conduct a bottom-up approach of the review with the participation of all stakeholders. Let me take this platform to acknowledge and thank ESCAP for the timely support and assistance to strengthen the social protection system of the Maldives. Thank you. Thank you, uh, distinguished delegate from Maldives. Next is delegate, distinguished delegate from Pakistan. May I invite the Pakistan delegate? Thank you, Chair, to give us the opportunity. And Pakistan, in collaboration with UNDP, has been implementing SDGs since 2016. Pakistan is probably the first country to adopt SDGs as a national development agenda through a resolution unanimously approved by all the parliamentarians on the 16th of February 2016. For evidence-based policymaking, we have started reducing the data gaps in 2016, and it is interesting to see that Bangladesh and Sri Lanka are pretty much doing the same way which we have done in the past four to five years. We have chosen our highest impact indicators and targets in 2018, as well as developed the SDGs portal, data portal, gender policy framework, gender portal, youth employment strategy, water and wash policies, and the list continues. Interestingly, the sustainability, inclusivity, and equity are the main pillars of these policies, which are the main spirit of sustainable development goals. 
We presented our first VNR in 2019, and this year we are presenting once again. It is a whole government approach and a whole of society approach which we are, which we are following, and all the multi-stakeholders are involved, including all the UN agencies working in Pakistan. This year, UNESCAF has introduced a training program to us. We are happy, very happy to do it with Sri Lanka, who is also presenting their second VNR this year. UNESCAF is also supporting us in writing, designing, and reviewing the VNR reports, as well as arranging study tours for both the countries. The Sri Lankan team came to Pakistan in February, and we both had very good discussion during this day on VNR and South-South cooperation. We are most probably going in May to showcasing what we have done in VNR, and, and we continue discussion forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Your Excellency. Now may I call upon the distinguished delegate from, the chi from China uh, to make your intervention. Liangu 中国将继续支持联合国系统在落实我们要坚持多边主义促进发展合作Thank you, uh, distinguished delegate from China. Next is uh, Republic of Korea, distinguished delegate from the Republic of Korea. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Honorable UN the Deputy Secretary General, Excellencies, distinguished delegates. At the outset, my delegation would like to express my sincere appreciation to the UN Deputy Secretary General, Her Excellency Amida Mohammed, for her insight and guide, guidance on the United Nations development systems, commitment to improve collective action in support of member states' implementation of the 2030 Agenda. The, the delegation of the Republic of Korea appreciates the, the efforts of ESCOP and, U, and UN agencies in Asia and the Pacific for acting as one, as one under regional collaborative mechanism. After leading the General Assembly's designation of the International Day of Clean Air, 
the Republic of Korea is holding the annual regional event with several UN organizations, including ESCAP, UNEP, UNICEF, and UNIDO, and, all, and, well, and well recognize uh, the contribution uh, of partnership among United Nations organizations. This, this annual event has uh, served not only as a commemorative event, but also as an open dialogue platform for mobilizing political will of member states. This is a small experience, but it provides a good reference. The Asia and the Pacific region needs to mobilize multilateral and regional cooperation for improving air quality, but it faces technical and political complexity due to varied, varied conditions across sub-regions and different technical capacities of countries. This, re this requires utilizing expertise and resources from multi multiple UN organizations working on air pollution through the issue-based coalition. This is a pre prerequisite to cope with the complexity and to build an effective regional platform. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, considering the ambition and urgency of accelerating the action towards the achievement of the 2030 agenda, we need co cohesive and integrated cooperation among all relevant actors. The Republic of Korea stands ready to support the United Nations acting as one to tackle regional challenges and implement the 2030 agenda. Thank you. Thank you, the distinguished delegate from Republic of Korea for your perspective. Now may I invite um, distinguished delegate from Indonesia to make your intervention. Am I audible? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes, we are. Thank you, you are. very much, sir. Uh, Excellencies, distinguished participants, all protocols observed. The government of Indonesia delivers this regional statement on the implementation of the new urban agenda. The statement was inclusively endorsed at the 21st March regional pre meeting to APFSD. This is in collaboration with UN Habitat and uh, UNSCAP. The second quadrennial report of the Secretary General on the implementation of new urban agenda highlights progress in the region on delivering commitments on the new urban agenda, but the challenges towards 2030 are immense. Implementing the new urban agenda at all levels and localizing the SDGs will support pandemic recovery and the full implementation of the 2030 agenda. This requires an inclusive, gender responsive and multi-stakeholders inform territorial development process, taking into account urban rural linkages. The quadrennial report find that priorities such as financing sustainable urban development and housing for all require stronger integrated governance. There is also an urgent need to address the digital divide. More capacity building and collaboration in the region is needed to accelerate actions, including through South-South and triangular cooperation. Asia and the Pacific also needs to scale up action on resilience, rapid and unplanned urbanization combined with climate change and the pandemic impact in the pandemic impact seriously on people's everyday life and economies now and in the future. The increased SDGs gain and uh, to increase SDG gains and address climate and disaster threats, it is pivotal to increase the resilience of settlement and communities, leaving no one and no place behind. Coordinated and stepped up action by cities and national governments are to achieve a net zero carbon footprint. Priorities include urgently reducing air pollution and waste, including plastics, increasing green infrastructure and smart energy and mobility solutions, and investing in safe and healthy housing by applying green building standards. The participants in the pre-meeting also called on member states 
local government and partners to share more knowledge and good practices, utilizing the Urban Agenda Platform, the Asia Pacific Urban Forum, and similar channel and venues. They call for the continued support of ESCAP, UN Habitat, local government association, and relevant regional partnerships. The participants encourage more voluntary local reviews using the regional guidelines to capture more local and subnational reporting on the localization of SDGs, taking into account national context and to increase multi-stakeholder participation and coordination with the voluntary national review processes. The participants of the pre-meeting also appreciated the reporting done to date on the implementation of the new urban agenda and the urban dimension of SDGs. They specifically look forward for more voluntary national and UA reporting by 2026 for the third quadrennial report. A stronger alignment of NUA reporting with voluntary national review on the 2030 agenda, as well as nationally determined contribution reporting, is recommended to increase effective annual reporting. I thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the Indonesian perspective on the uh, SDGs goals. Uh, now, yeah, Excellency, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Ms. Amina Muhammad had to leave, and uh, we will move on to the next speaker thereafter. Thank you, Madam, for your intervention and the support. Now, may I invite the distinguished delegate from Thailand to make your intervention. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Distinguished participants, Thailand commenced the efforts on the repositioning of the UNDS, led by the Deputy Secretary General as Chair of the UNSDG. And thank you also for the in comprehensive introduction and the reflection on this agenda item. Thailand wishes to make three brief points. First, we reiterate our support for the work of the UNDS, including through the UNRC and UNCT, for their, um, it is a, which is a country-led and prioritizes international needs. The UN regional assets should also contribute to these efforts to support the development needs of the countries in the region. Thailand is pleased that the recently concluded UNSDCF between Thailand and the UN is closely aligned with Thailand development priorities. We look forward to this timely and effective implementation. Second, with the multitude of pressing challenges and limited resources, we stress the importance in the restructure of the UN's regional architecture to be more streamlined, region-specific, and built on synergy with complementarities. We are seeing positive results through the Asia-Pacific Regional Collaboration Platform and five issue-based co coalitions. In particular, we commend the efforts in the integration of health in DRR under the issue-based coalition in building resilience. This area is crucial to the, 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 this disaster-prone Asia-Pacific and our preparedness for future incidents. Thailand wishes to see the further collaboration and progress in this area of health and DRR, including timely consultation to shape policy tools and guidance that will support the implementation of health aspect of, of the Sendai framework by taking note of Bangkok principle, as mandated by the member states in the seventh session of the Committee on DRR. Third, we believe that greater synergies and complementarities between regional commission and sub-regional organization are needed to accelerate the attainment of the SDG. The homegrown development approaches could also be leveraged as a mean to further accelerate the implementation of the SDG in both national and local level. I thank you very much. Thank you, Thailand. Next is IGES on behalf of the science and technology community. The floor is yours. 
Ladies and gentlemen, in the interest of time, all protocols observed. My name is Simon Olsen. I work with the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies and speak on behalf of the science and technological community and the Asia-Pacific Regional CSO Engagement Mechanism. From the perspective of civil society, we want to be a part of the conversation when it comes to system-wide initiatives. As recent as 2019, we were invited as observers to what was then called Regional Coordination Mechanism, which I believe is now called Regional Collaborative Platform, in a sense. We therefore emphasize the importance of also ensuring CSO voices and inputs in those initiatives. Earlier, we also heard about issue-based coalitions. Here, we humbly suggest there needs to be a balance between technical expert knowledge on the one hand and constituency-based inputs that can come from different civil society stakeholders. That way, we can ensure that inputs address the challenges of citizens from various walks of life as much as possible and that traditional and local knowledge can come to bear. I want to reiterate one or two suggestions that we have raised before in these forums in past years. Namely, that the region deepens its integration to support regional resilience and equality. To this end, the regional UN system needs to conduct a feasibility study towards establishing a regional tax body or forum to align tax architectures across the region. This is to ensure that resources can be mobilized effectively and efficiently. We've actually also heard today that the ADB is working along those lines. Here, it would be good to ensure this is built in the context of accelerated action on Agenda 2030. Second, we suggest the UN system undertake a regional human rights SDGs compatibility assessment to ensure that progress on some SDGs doesn't happen on the cost of rights and dignity of the people in the region. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that intervention um, from the IGES. The next is from Institute for Social Enterprise in Asia. The floor is yours now uh, for your representation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am Gomer Padong from the Institute for Social Entrepreneurship in Asia, and I deliver this intervention on behalf of the Social and Community Enterprise constituency of the Asia Pacific Regional CSO Engagement Mechanism. We recommend that appropriate technology and community-based and community-oriented innovations be supported, adopted, and mainstreamed. To this end, the UN system must undertake in-depth assessment of new and emerging technologies, including digital technologies, to prevent adverse impacts on livelihoods, communities, and culture, among others. If anything, adoption of digitalization should, deter should be determined and co-developed with communities, not imposed on them. We, co we want to contribute a local perspective to this discussion. Community networks as an important segment of social and community enterprises are examples of sound and inclusive technologies and innovations. Community networks have always been about connecting the unconnected and enabling connectivity of the remote rural areas and bridging the urban-rural digital divide. It also bridges the other social divides of gender, societal class, and caste. As access is still a distant dream for other areas in the region, the installation of community networks had been one innovative way by which access is, create, is created based on the needs of communities, designing of frugal technologies and its usage, providing an alternative to connectivity that can be locally owned and operated, catering to both fluctuating demands and issues of affordability. Implicit within the discourse of last mile connectivity is a critical lens that questions who these are for, what their significance is, and finally succeeds in participating within their use and design. Community networks employ a participatory model that emerges from the immediate needs and context of communities where members can be involved in all levels from its design to implementation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next uh, is 
the distinguished delegate from Russia. The floor is yours. Спасибо, господин председатель. Уважаемая госпожа исполнительный секретарь комиссии, уважаемые коллеги, мы бы хотели очень коротко отметить следующее в рамках того пункта повестки дня, который мы сейчас рассматриваем. Пункт повестки дня 3. Общесистемные результаты деятельности системы развития ООН на региональном уровне ВТР в поддержку повестки дня на период 2030 года. В этом контексте мы бы хотели подчеркнуть актуальность тех пяти трансформативных областей, которые выделялись генеральным секретарем для укрепления региональных активов. В этой связи мы бы хотели ориентировать комиссию на последовательное и всестороннее задействование этих самых реструктурированных региональных активов. Мы считаем, что они реально способны содействовать выполнению повестки 2030. В этом контексте мы хотели бы прежде всего выделить региональную коллаборативную платформу и единый механизм регионального координации, Unified Mechanism for Regional. Считаем также важным работать над тем, чтобы полноценно использовать потенциал тематических коалиций которые созданы в рамках региональной платформы сотрудничества. Мы считаем, что последовательное всестороннее использование потенциала этих механизмов имеет исключительно важное значение для общесистемного подхода в реализации повестки 2030. Thank you. Uh, the next is the floor is to the distinguished delegate from the Islamic Republic of Iran, Iran. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, for giving me the floor at the outset. I would like to express my huge appreciation to Secretariat for its great leadership of this meeting. Uh, I believe uh, by its own, it's a great success that we, the delegations of a large part of world's population are cooperating on a vital pla plan based on our agreed values for a better future. Inspired by the ancient literature of my homeland, anybody who deserves a soul from God sure deserves to be counted and identified. In this regard and in this context, I would like to expand this content and this concept. Anybody who deserves a soul from God sure deserves to be counted and identified and deserve the right to development. Mr. Chair, notwithstanding the detrimental effects of unilateral measures against Iranian nation, my country has tried to make significant progress in implementing sustainable development components. Regarding goal four, the literacy rate among Iranian is now at 90 7% of population, it's worth noting that the, from a moral and humanitarian point of view, 500,000 of refugee students have been registered and at Iranian schools and universities. Concerning goal five, as pertains to women and their participation, at least 
15% of college students and 27 of faculty members and 37% of medical doctors are currently women at decision-making level. There has been a remarkable increase in appointment. And uh, regarding the goal six on clean water and sanitation, currently 99% uh, of the urban and almost 90% of the rural population in Iran and our sex to safe drinking water. Mr. Chair, let me finish with the poem of famous poet of Iran, Saadi Shirazi, that says, human beings are members of a whole in creation of one essence and soul. If one member is afflicted with pain, other members uneasy will remain. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, the distinguished uh, delegate from Iran. Now the floor is to you and Habitat for you to make your presentation or intervention rather. Thank you. Distinguished delegate. In today's the area intervention uh, by the distinguished delegate of Indonesia. UN Habitat wishes to convey its strong appreciation for bringing up the collective statement on the implementation of new ABA agenda in the Asia Pacific region in support of full implementation of 2030 development agenda. I'd like to remind member states that the President of General Assembly is convening a high level meeting in New York on 28th April to put more emphasis on the new urban agenda implementation and reporting and how countries can achieve more localization of SDGs, including voluntary subnational and local reviews. As explained by the distinguished delegate of Indonesia, a representative from 25 countries, from relevant ministers, ministries, permanent missions, cities and local government associations, and many other partners met on 21st March at the pre-meeting pre of APFST on invitation of UN SCAP Executive Secretary and UN Habitat Executive Director to prepare regional input for the high-level meeting, taking into consideration a second quadrennial report on the implementation of new ABA agenda that uh, Secretary General released earlier this month. I wish to thank again uh, the government of Indonesia for its strong support and also appreciate the support of statement from government representatives, including Fiji, Lao PDR, Nepal, the Philippines, Turkey, and Solomon Islands. So with that, I thank you uh, very much. Thank you very much for all those interventions under item number three. Uh, now, Now we have uh, concluded the interventions on that session. May I now invite Amida Salsia Chisana, Under Secretary General of the United Nations and the Executive Secretary of the ASCAP to give her concluding remarks okay. uh, about the test proceedings. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair, and thank you very much on um, our appreciation to uh, distinguished delegates from member states, uh, representative of CSO, for your remarks, input suggestion on agenda item three. We take note on uh, several of your uh, suggestion and also issues that you highlighted. Uh, among others are the need to leverage further our system-wide uh, intervention 
or support by linking the global, uh, regional, as well as a national level. So the, the vertical sort of integration, uh, as well as we take note on the issues of priority areas mentioned, which we've been working on, uh, among others, climate action, including uh, to tackle air pollution, the leave no one behind, including the social protection, aging, the digital divide, and potential to accelerate uh, SDGs as well as to accelerate the transformation, yeah? utilizing the digitalization. Uh, you also mentioned of the need to uh, pay particular attention to the segment of the population uh, as uh, to leave no one behind, as well as uh, to uh, pay particular attention to the segment of the population in order to benefit yeah, from the intervention from the high high or the highest uh, multiplier effect, namely women use, the, the so-called the intergenerational uh, dimension of the, 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 the benefits. Uh, also, uh, several of the delegates uh, uh, mentioned on the particular attention needed to uh, the so-called CSS yeah, countries, countries in special situation, namely the LDCs, LLDCs, and the SITs. And uh, lastly, also a lot of uh, support uh, to the region, uh, to region to deliver as as one. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Armida, for that uh, concluding remarks on your part. Now, may I call upon uh, Ms. Kani Vignaraja, Assistant Secretary General, uh, to give her thought about the interventions. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Maybe let me um, just uh, add to what uh, Ibu Armida just uh, said with the three points that I picked up um, over and above um, what has been said. Uh, first is uh, how much we have to learn and how much we have to make sure we bring to you some of the new thinking, the new applications, uh, whether that's uh, related to uh, data and analytics, whether that's related to science and technology, uh, whether that's related to um, institutional changes that are happening uh, not just in our region but around the world. Um, and that uh, helps us to respond um, differently to the challenges in front of you. So we will keep raising our level of ambition uh, in terms of how we uh, bring this uh, to you. That relates then to the second issue, which is that this, the regional collaborative platform we're talking about and the issue-based coalitions these are our internal working mechanisms. So just like your organizations have your internal working mechanisms, uh, these are ours. And you can imagine with over 40 entities in the UN system, it's important to have some internal mechanisms so we can bring some discipline and rigor into the way we uh, interact and coordinate uh, with each other. But in doing so, it is absolutely essential, and that point is very t well taken, that uh, we bring to it all of what we hear, the feedback, uh, the constant engagement we must all have and continue to have with our stakeholders, our partners, both in state institutions and in non-state uh, institutions. Without that, we're just talking to each other, and that's of little use to anyone. And the third and last is how fundamentally important, and you have reiterated this, is to keep upholding uh, regional cooperation and multilateral cooperation, and particularly in such troubled times. Uh, these days when uh, you have a war in one part of the world, it has immediate implications and repercussions for everyone in every other part of the world, whether that's political, economic, uh, or otherwise. So the fact that these gatherings and the ability to exchange formally and informally with each other, I think is, is absolutely critical and I think you have reaffirmed this to us and hence in doing so also reaffirmed our need to make sure we are strong through our RCP. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Madam, for your concluding remarks on that. With that, uh,
the meeting had thus concluded uh, its deliberation under agenda item number three. Uh, nevertheless, we are not concluding the proceedings of today because in there have been many interventions which are lined up under 2A and 2B. So we thought of making use of a little bit of time uh, for uh, interventions under 2A and 2B. May I now invite interventions under 2A and 2B to start with? National Indigenous Disabled Women of Nepal. May I invite the National Indigenous Disabled Women of Nepal to make your intervention, please? Under 2A and 2B. Yeah, there. Yeah. Uh, Madam, we can uh, hear you. If you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Am I audible? Uh, now we are audible. Yes. Yeah. Your Excellency, respected dignitaries, member states, and delegates, I am Pema Wangmulama Mugum, an indigenous youth belonging to the Mugum indigenous community from Nepal, and bring to you the voices of 600 and more young people from 33 countries across Asia and the Pacific coming from a range of backgrounds in terms of our age, race, disability, geographical location, socioeconomic status, sexual and gender identities, expressions and characteristics among others. We came into the Youth Forum with our experiences derived from our lived in realities. We engaged in cross country and intra-regional exchanges, learning, sharing, and the review of SDG progress to put forward our unified voice and demands to this youth call to action. There is no building back better from COVID-19 without us. We are the young people who have not been prioritized for COVID-19 vaccine access and are also facing the effects of climate change, environmental degradation, lack of access to education and essential health services war, migration, natural disasters, and rising inequalities and discrimination directly affecting our lives and our future. Climate change and natural disasters have created more economic constraints for families, which in turn created an increase in the risk of gender-based sexual violence and even early and forced child marriage. We urge the member states in the region to implement policies to reduce the digital gap and recover from learning losses while addressing the learning crisis and improving digital learning opportunities, ensuring digital security, including privacy and confidentiality of young people in all their diversity. Mainstream comprehensive sexuality education for in-school and out-of-school students and integrate CSE and the Sustainable Development Goals in school curricula. Remove discriminatory laws regulations and policies and eradicate harmful practices such as early and forced child marriage, chaupati and female genital mutilation or cutting on an urgent basis. Strengthen meaningful and inclusive youth involvement in the nationally determined contributions, commitments, its implementations and carbon neutrality pledges and increase youth and locally led green investments and funding to match the targets, prioritizing indigenous and marginalized communities. Allocate budget and set priorities to uplift youth-led organization and the inclusivity of young, young people across decision-making processes at all levels, across all sustainable development goals. Increase investment in generating disaggregated data in regards to the education system, drop out as well as SDGs. COVID-19, now going into its third year, has severely impacted the progress across youth sustainable development. And we, with this youth call to action, call for priority action now. Thank you very much. Thank you for that intervention. Uh, next is Uzbekistan, followed by Japan. The floor is yours, Uzbekistan.
Japan? Yeah. Uh, can we go to the Japan? The distinguished delegate from Japan. Japan. Uh, next is Asia Pacific Resource and Research Center for Women, ARO. Can we have ARO? Yes. Uh, respected Chair and Delegates, I'm Sai from the Asian Pacific Resource and Research Center for Women. On behalf of the Women Constituency, which includes women in all their diversity, LBQ women, trans persons, we make this intervention to provide an overview of progress and actions needed towards gender equality in the region. The ESCAP 2022 Progress Report on Gender Equality points to a pertinent deep gap around lack of data to even measure progress towards most of the gender equality targets. This is further challenged by exacerbated uh, impact of the pandemic, increased gender-based violence, widened economic inequalities, and further erosion of public services, including vaccine inequity. This directly also connects to goal 17 around data availability across all disaggregation, across all SDGs, and lack of adequate investments around social, economic, and environmental dimensions. Systemic and structural barriers continue to impede women's rights. And unless there is a strong political will to advance women's rights and accelerate implementation efforts, it is impossible to achieve gender equality in this region. We call upon member states to reconsider macroeconomic policies that benefit only a few corporations and disadvantage the majority of the population, including women, and put women, human rights, and gender equality at the heart of efforts around COVID-19. Further, we want you to ensure fulfillment of sexual and reproductive health and rights and bodily autonomy and access to comprehensive sexuality education and SRH services without stigma and discrimination. Expand data to include women's unpaid care work and actively recognize, reduce, and redistribute care work. Public investments are crucial in the care economy and introduction of gender responsive social protection mechanisms is ever pertinent. We want you to advance adequate investments in a care infrastructure, such as creches, shelters, halfway houses, and transition homes, which can facilitate women to enter and sustain skill training, higher education, and work participation. Let us do away with privatization policies, especially on essential services for women, such as around health and education. And gender-based discrimination, gender-based violence, harmful practices, including violence and harassment at work, ratify the implementation of the CEDAW and also key legal instruments aimed at fostering equality and eliminating violence and harassment such as ILO Convention 111 on discrimination and ILO Convention 190 on violence and harassment. Treat COVID-19 vaccine as a global public good and abandon vaccine nationalism and the stockpiling of vaccinations and support the TRIPS COVID-19 waiver. Women, young people, trans and gender diverse persons need to be central to an equitable and an inclusive recovery from COVID-19 through vaccine equity. Support community-based women-led climate solutions and strengthen the ambitions and uh, implementation of the nationally determined contributions, ensuring meaningful participation, the leadership and the reflection of women's voices and priorities. In conclusion, it is time we prioritize and implement actions and work towards gender justice and gender just societies now. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that presentation by Yaro. Uh, next is uh, Timo Leste and after that UNAP. UNEP. Mr. Chair, distinguished gentlemen, guests, ladies and gentlemen, the SDG agenda 
of 2030 is precisely in line with the spirit and letter of Timor Leste Strategic Development Plan, SDP, which was established in 2011 with the target of concluding all these goals by 2030. Timor Leste is aware that it should harmonize all the efforts with the thematic focus of 2019 CDG's agenda on empowering people and ensuring inclusiveness and equality in line with the national objectives enshrined in the Strategic Development Plan of 2011-2030. I'm happy to share that Timor Leste's SDP indicators of enhancing human development, improving livelihoods, strengthening development institutions, and the sustainable development growth in line with SDCPs, SDPs agenda are all well placed to achieve within the vision and are assured by the political will, economic potential, national integration, and the dynamic population. On human development, development aside from enforcing a free education from basic to high school and impose, impose very moderate fees on in universities, university levels, it has been working hard in outsourcing opportunities to avail good education for all Timorese without distinction on ethnicity, skin color, creed, and gender. The government have been uh, sending the students to study in Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, Singapore, Brazil, Portugal, Australia, China, Japan, US, Mozambique, New Zealand, and Cuba, and most of these programs are funded under the Human Development Agency Institute of Development. As a logical consequence of the long-lasting political difficulties it experienced decades ago, Timor Leste recognized that it is still facing enormous challenges potential in hindering it to fully comply with the goals set up under the SDG. However, as all these goals are well mandated to, uh, to be achieved under the SDP, SDP's vision 2030, we are certain that uh, they may be delayed for some obvious constraint, but for sure, we will make all necessary efforts to achieve that. I'm happy to share that the effective, to effectively and e efficiently implement the government programs for the implementation of the SDGs goals, all the goals are distributed among the relevant institutions. On policy coherence, Timor Leste has adopted an integrated planning and budgeting framework which aligns its strategic development plans with SDGs. Apart from multifaceted challenges derived from the past political difficulties, Timor Leste is not escaping from the ongoing global pandemic. During these two long years, the rhythm of national development is, in every aspect, has been slowed down, which significantly affected the process towards complying with the SDGs. We all hope that science could swiftly find a decisive antidote in order to put and end the pandemic and bring back the world to normalcy. Thank you so much. Thank you. UNEP. Thank you, Chair. Excellencies, distinguished participants, the fifth United Nations Environment Assembly held February in Nairobi agreed on a number of critical resolutions which can play a leading role in supporting the theme of this ninth Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development. At the Assembly, the world's environment ministers agreed to establish an intergovernmental negotiating committee with the mandate to forge an internationally legally binding agreement to end plastic pollution. The UNEA ministerial declaration recognizes humanity's failure to date to manage chemicals and waste, a threat that is further aggravated by the COVID-19 pandemic through widespread use of single-use plastics and chemicals. In the spirit of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, a third key resolution agreed by the Assembly focuses on nature-based solutions, actions to protect, conserve, restore, sustainably use and manage ecosystems. 
UNEP would like to encourage member states in this region to actively follow up on these important resolutions to ensure that the issues and concerns of this region are fully addressed. UNEP, of course, stands ready to support this effort. Allow me to also note that the fourth forum of ministers and environment authorities of Asia Pacific was held successfully in October 2021 in Suwon City, the Republic of Korea. Ministers at the forum stated that government policies in response to COVID-19 can reinforce the linkages between human well-being, creation of green jobs, and the health of ecosystems. They further underline that developing countries require support to transition to greener, more sustainable development pathways post-COVID, and that there is a need for nature-based solutions in the long term as part of COVID recovery plans. I thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And now it's reality of aid and followed by IOM Bangkok. Uh, good afternoon. I am Sarah Torres from Rua AP, uh, representing the NGO constituency of the APRCM. So multi-stakeholder partnerships are crucial, of course, in achieving the goals. And NGOs play an important role in pursuing people-centered development. However, support given to organizations remains lacking as development finance is increasingly dispersed to private sector institutions and as civic spaces continue to shrink amid repressive regimes, just like in our country, the Philippines. Despite the calls for more inclusive partnerships, just like today, development processes have been subjected to corporate capture, which risks es eschewing accountability structures. This has ex exacerbated the impacts of the pandemic and also the associated policy responses to the people. For instance, as vaccine production remains in the hands of big pharma, supply inequality contributes to mutations and outbreaks in developing countries. Pursuance of donor and private sector economic and security interests over addressing inequalities have worsened conflict and fragility. Exploitation of natural resources to amass profit largely contributed to the worsening climate crisis. And in order to tread the path of transformative development, an enabling environment for organizations, which sec secures their rights and provides them appropriate financing to carry out their work is paramount. In this regard, we call donor countries to meet the 0.7% GNI commitment of ODA and 0.2% commitment to those in chronic conflict and state of fragility. They must also scale up financing for social protection for all. Similarly, national governments must utilize ODA for sustainable development of their constituents. Donor governments and IFIs must also stop using aid for their own interests, and the disbursement of aid must be localized, even decolonized, to be given to local NGOs and people's groups as they know the situation on the ground best. In times of crisis, we show our effectiveness in pursuing an inclusive and holistic approach and providing immediate relief while also working toward long-term development for the marginalized and vulnerable. So localization allows for the democratic ownership of development priorities and not of private sector interests. And this allows NGOs to respond to the root causes of conflict and fragility and also help in mitigating the impacts of climate change for the disproportionately affected. But again, we cannot do it alone. So the twofold agenda of building back better from the pandemic and advancing the full implementation of Agenda 2030 will only be possible with the recognition of prevailing systemic failures that have left our peoples even further behind. Therefore, we reiterate the need to pursue the framework of development justice, which ensure, ensures redistributive economic, social, gender, and environmental justice with the participation of local voices and accountability from development actors as the pathway to build back better. Thank you. Thank you. IOM Banco. They are not here. Shall we go to the next? They are not here. Yeah. We'll move on to the United Nations Capital Development Fund, UNCDF.
we'll move on to Asia, Asia indigenous people pact. They're here. Thank you very much, dear chair, for this intervention opportunity. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I am Prem Singh Tharu from Nepal speaking on behalf of the Asia Indian People Pact, uh, representing here the Indian People's constituency of the APRSM. The pandemic exposed the inequalities and discrimination faced by the Indian Peoples in access to social protection and services, quality healthcare and education, and continued lack of respect for our indigenous identity, knowledge, and contribution to the national development. While some communities were able to contain the spread of the virus using traditional measures and sustaining with forest and local resources, unfortunately, this was not the case of case for indigenous communities in a palm oil plantation and mining areas and those whose lands were expropriated for development projects without their APIC. Their traditional livelihoods have been severely impacted due to lack of market for their produce as they could not compete with increased import of agricultural products as in the case of the indigenous farmers. The indigenous peoples depending their territories are, are criminalized falsely and access to justice and and fair hearing are routinely denied. The contribution of indigenous peoples, including indigenous women, in protection and promotion of nature, resources, biodiversity, and the planet are not recognized, and traditional natural resource management are criminalized in some cases. Our indigenous land and territories, rich in biodiversity and home to the remaining flora and fauna, is under threat with the imposition of extractive projects nature-based solutions, and the shift to renewable energy being implemented without our APIC, and continuing denial of state in recognizing our collective land rights. The need to care for remaining forest and resources is needed, but conservation measures need to ensure a right-based people-centered approach, legal recognition of the collective land rights, and recognition of indigenous people's right, as enshrined in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. The indigenous peoples, including in Suman, are critically important to address the historical injustice committed against and continuing marginalization of the indigenous peoples. COVID-19 recovery measures in the short and long term should ensure the full and effective participation of the indigenous peoples. Last but not the least, we indigenous peoples demand to timely replicate the indigenous expertise, knowledge, and good practices in policy and programs of the states to achieve the SDGs. And we wish for successful accomplishment of the ninth APFSD. And let's learn from the soil and in its peoples and replicate in our daily life if we, really, if we are really committed to make the sustainable change and experience the real change by 2030. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you. Now, uh, the, video, the uh, presentation by the Vietnam on Agenda 2A. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, as you all see, the world continues to suffer heavy losses due to the COVID-19 pandemic, including the lives of millions of people. According to a study of ESCAF, nearly 90 million people in our region may have been pushed into extreme poverty. The latest Sustainable Development Goals Progress Assessment conducted by the ESCA shows that achieving SDGs is increasingly out of reach. In Vietnam, the latest available data for 2020-2021 shows that the COVID-19 pandemic has been imposing significant negative impact on the implementation of the SDGs especially the goal number three, goal number four, goal number eight, and goal number ten. Despite 
these challenges, Vietnam has made great efforts to sustain SDG's implementation and continue to make some considerable progress. In goal number seven, goal number nine, and goal number 17. Specifically, the shares of renewable energy, including wind power, solar power, and biomass power. In total, final energy consumption has increased rapidly in recent years, reaching 12.3% in 2021, compared to only 0.5% in 2018. Cell phone signal coverage has expanded to 99.8% of the population. Export turnover in 2021 increased by 19% compared to 2020. In the context that the world and the region are facing multiple challenges and opportunities, Vietnam would like to propose following recommendations to encourage and strengthen uh, the implementation of the SDG in coming times. Firstly, completing the policy system and improving the effectiveness of policy enforcement and assure equal contribution and benefits for all the people, including implementation of national recovery strategies uh, with special attention to vulnerable groups. Second, Awareness raising and promoting coordinations, uh, collaborations, and uh, participations among all stakeholders. Thirdly, effectively mobilizing and using financial resources. Fourthly, developing human resources quality in a company with uh, promoting innovation, science, and technology development and application. Fifthly, improving resilient capacity to uncertain risk from climate change, natural disasters, and diseases. Sixthly, strengthening data capacity to provide timely evidence for tracking, monitoring, and evaluation of SDGs. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Excellency. And now let me invite Indonesia for your presentation. Thank you, Chair. Indonesia continues its effort in building forward better. The President of the Republic of Indonesia has stated that despite the pandemic, SDG's target will remain unchanged and Indonesia will push the 2030 agenda as a priority. SDGs also serves as a framework for Indonesia's inclusive and sustainable economic transformation, which is focusing on the six strategy. Those strategies are competitiveness of human resources, economic productivity, green economy, digital transformation, integration of domestic economy, and the new capital city relocation. And those strategies are supported by improving the bureaucracy as well as fiscal and financial sector reform. In 2021, the government of Indonesia's response to COVID-19 are implemented through free massive vaccines, lowered prices of COVID-19 testing, telemedicine services, and integrated digital information database of COVID-19. And this has had a positive impact and a step closer to economic recovery. Indonesia's economy continues to grow to 3.69% after its fall to minus 2.07% in 2020. Poverty and inequality have 
increased to 10.19 percent in 2020 to 9.71% in 2021. And Gini ratio is decreasing from 0 0.385 in 2020 to 0 0.381 in 2021. We hope that this trend will continue and it can ensure Indonesia's trajectory of its economy to become a high income country by 2045. Indonesia's 34 provinces and 514 districts proposes a challenge in localizing SDGs and the implementation of the principles of inclusivity and leaving no one left behind. Therefore, SDGs has been mainstream in our national low carbon and climate resilient development agenda, which is then translated into sub-national development agenda. Inclusiveness and leaving no one left behind remain our commitment as we continue to complete data disaggregation such as provincial and cities, urban, rural, and disability status. The Statistics Indonesia has collected data for 117 out of 289 national SDGs indicators, of which 101 indicators are disaggregated for provinces, 26 for cities districts, 51 for urban rural, and 22 for dis disability status. To overcome availability of data or disaggregated data for sub-national level, Statistics Indonesia is using small area estimation to complement the disaggregation as an extra effort for areas without adequate data from survey or without adequate administrative data. The Ministry of National Development Planning as the coordinator of SDGs implementation in Indonesia. We will continue to strengthen partnerships with all stakeholders. In this year's APFSD, sectoral ministries will be giving intervention on their respective thematic discussion, as well as the Supreme Audit Board, which continues to oversee the implementation of SDGs in Indonesia. We also involve non-state actors in SDGs implementation, including the formulation of all the voluntary national reports and national or sub-national action plans. We have strengthened collaboration with faith-based CSOs, including in SDGs financing. We have also continued to empower the youth to be actively involved in SDGs movements. We encourage the sub-national level to model after the national coordination of SDGs implementation. We have also engaged with 26 SDG centers in universities across Indonesia to support and work together with the sub-national government. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Today, the final intervention uh, comes from the United States of America. On behalf of the United States, it is an honor to speak with the fellow ESCAP members at this year's Forum on Sustainable Development. You can count on the strong partnership of the United States to work together to fully implement the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Before I speak about the SDGs, I would like to first say a word about the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We stand in solidarity with the people of Ukraine, who are inspiring the world as they defend their country from Russia's premeditated, unprovoked, and unjustified attacks. We are committed to Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity and will continue to support Ukraine and its people. As we gather in Bangkok to advance SDGs focused on education, gender equality, and environmental protection, we condemn Russia's assault on Ukraine's schools, maternity hospitals, and natural ecosystems. 
The regional forum is an opportunity to show that the international community stands united against the Kremlin's aggression and for peace, cooperation, and the UN Charter. Let me now speak briefly about U.S. partnership in the region on SDGs 4, 5, 14, and 15. To advance SDG 4, quality education, the United States works in partnership with countries throughout the region. Ten U.S. agencies, including USAID and the Millennium Challenge Corporation, partner globally to improve education systems at all levels. Every year, these programs support governments and civil society with over $1 billion in assistance. We are likewise inspired by leadership from governments around the region. Our friends in India are leading by example by providing educational opportunities for women in marginalized communities, including financial literacy, so they can be competitive business owners. Back home, we similarly seek to eliminate disparities in our own education system and ensure equal access for marginalized populations. On SDG 5, to advance gender equality and women's empowerment, Vice President Kamala Harris has said, the participation of women strengthens democracy. Women's political participation promotes strong democracies, growing economies, and stable and lasting peace, which are critical to achieving the SDGs. We are proud to partner with ESCAP countries on SDG 5 through U.S. government programs that advance inclusive growth by strengthening women's economic empowerment, including our work to end gender-based violence. And at ASEAN, USAID supports programs on women's empowerment, including the development of a whole of ASEAN gender mainstreaming strategic framework. We also call for the UN system to be a model for gender equality and inclusion. The United States is committed to supporting the UN to fully implement its system-wide policy of zero tolerance for sexual exploitation and abuse. Regarding SDGs 14 and 15, the protection of our natural ecosystems is one of President Biden's top priorities, and we look forward to the Our Ocean Conference and the UN Ocean Conference. We continue to find inspiration from regional leaders such as Indonesia, which manages a diverse network of marine protected ecosystems spanning 3.6 million hectares supported by a conservation trust fund. The United States strongly supported the UN Environment Assembly's launch of negotiations for a global agreement to combat ocean plastic pollution, and we look forward to participating in that process. Domestically, we have endorsed the goal of conserving at least 30% of land and water by 2030, which we support including in the global biodiversity framework. I'll conclude with a request to stay in touch. Please reach out to me and my colleagues at our embassies in the region with ideas on how we can deepen our cooperation and accelerate the full implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You want... Uh, an intervention from the United Russia, yes. Please. Um, yeah. yeah, unfortunately, the, I understand the interpreters are not here. They have all gone, but you can make your point. We will note it now. На русском языке. Uh, I see that we do not have interpretation, which is very unfortunate. We do not believe that that was an appropriate move by the commission that we are continuing beyond hours without interpretation. And you see that now we are in a very inconvenient situation because we are not in a position and we are in an equal position 
we have to make a statement on an important issue without interpretation. So we protest about the issue that we do not have interpretation in the boot. Um, and uh, now I have to say that we have to ask for the floor on the point of order in light of Rule 26 of the Rules of Procedures of the SCAP. And uh, it is very unfortunate, honestly. It's quite unexpected. And it's already like the third time in a row within a short period of time that we need to raise a point of order uh, at the meetings of the uh, bodies of the conference structure of the commission uh, because number of delegation in the past and now the delegation of the United States used the uh, UNS cap premises for making remarks on the issue which has nothing to do with the uh, items included in the adopted agenda of the meeting. And what is the purpose of those kind of remarks as were included in the statement by the delegation of the United States? The similar rhetorics has already been aired twice in this month. First time on the 15th of March during the meeting of the Advisory and Consultative Committee of the Permanent Representatives. And the second time, it is on 18th of March, during the meeting of, for, or during the preparatory meeting for the Committee on Environment and Development. So, what is the value added for those kind of remarks to be uh, repeated at the Asia Pacific Forum on Sustainable Development? Um, and of course, uh, we have to say that the, state, uh, the remarks made uh, by the representative of the U.S. delegation are unacceptable in essence, nor do they have anything to do with the matters under the consideration by our meeting and the agenda item that which was under the consideration. It is all more inappropriate for the UNSCAP format to understand that one need only to look at the documents regarding the terms of reference of the committee. Such th statements, uh, we believe, uh, and we firmly believe, are incapable of leading to any reasonable result. They are fraught with attempts to incite Russophobia and undermine the normative foundations of UNSCAP, politicize the work of the Commission, and unfortunately divert the attention of member states for dealing with the issues highlighted on the adopted agenda. Um, for the future purposes, we ask you, Mr. Chair, in accordance with your prerogatives under Rule 25 and Rule 26 of the UNSCAP Rules of Procedure to immediately call on the delegations of uh, all UNSCAP members, states, to refrain from making remarks that are not relevant to the subject under the discussion and included in the uh, adopted agenda and instead to urge the delegations to focus on dealing with the items included in the adopted agenda of the meeting. And of course, uh, on behalf of the delegation of the Russian Federation, we also appeal to all delegations of UNSCAP members, states, to refrain from politically indoctrinated rhetoric that is not relevant to the substantive item included in the adopted agenda of the meeting, nor to the urgent issues we are discussing now, such as socioeconomic development and matters related to the sustainable development in Asia and the Pacific. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, the distinguished delegate from the 
Russia. Your concerns are noted. Uh, I request everyone to confine your remarks in terms of Rule 25 and 26 to the matters which have been discussed. Um, your concerns will be passed on to the Secretariat. With that, uh, we will conclude the today's uh, proceedings. Uh, tomorrow we shall start <coughs> the meeting at 10, 10, uh, 10 hours, 10, 10 o'clock in the morning, with the parallel roundtable discussions under Agenda Item 2 on review and assessment of progress in implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals, especially on Goals 4, 5, 14, 15 and 17. Uh, there are a number of side events starting from 8 a.m. Uh, before the meeting in which you may be interested in attending. Please kindly refer to the list of side events, including their registration details that have been posted on the meeting website. I would now like to invite the Secretary to make some housekeeping announcement. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, excellencies, distinguished delegates, as indicated by the Chair, we have a series of side events right uh, after this, actually, and uh, also from 8 a.m. tomorrow onwards when, uh, before we resume our session at 10 a.m. For tomorrow's session, we will have five roundtables. First, we will start with an assessment of progress and implementation of SDG 17, which will be held in conference room 3 from 10 to 12 p.m. Um, this will be followed by two roundtable discussions uh, on the assessment of implementation of Sustainable Development Goals 4 and 14, which will run in parallel from 12.30 to 2.30. A roundtable on SDG 4 will be held in Conference Room 3 and on SDG 14 in Meeting Room A. The last two roundtables will take place from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. tomorrow afternoon. The roundtable on SDG 5 will take place in Conference Room 3 and on goal 15 in meeting room A. Um, for the on-site delegates who received a four-day meeting badge, do please keep your meeting badge with you. When you arrive at the entrance tomorrow, you can show it to security officers and they'll permit you to enter the compound. For delegates who have to submit a daily ATK test, please show your email notification at the registration desk to receive a daily issued badge. Uh, before leaving the room, please ensure that you have all of your valuables and personal belongings with you. Um, and also, I'd like you to ask, I'd like to ask you to leave the room with proper physical distancing, please. For participants who are online, please use the Zoom meeting link that you've received with your registration to access the meetings tomorrow. Um, for each roundtable, a separate email with the Zoom registration link was linked, uh, was a, a separate email with the Zoom registration link was sent. Um, and you will have to register to each roundtable to receive your unique Zoom link. Um, on Wednesday, we will resume the agenda item two of the APFSD at 10 a.m. Bangkok time in SCAP Hall, as well as via Kudo. Um, this said, I'd like to wish you all a pleasant evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>